Do you think? No, not generally. I try not to. It makes my head hurt these days. But thank the Lord for Don McGann. You know, thank the Lord. Like, really, that's where we're at now. Okay, great, great. That's a really good idea, Senator Harris. Why don't we just go ahead and forfeit? The rest of the little power the Congress yeah. has left to the executive. That's a great cool. idea. Mm-hmm. When they're at, when she's asked about the color of her husband's skin and she's yeah. not willing to call out the fact that that's fucking racist, so fuck you. Welcome to the salt of the streets. Coming at you every week with this food for thought. Hope you're ready to eat. With everything going on in this nation, we need some information. And that's why salt need to be stationed in your rotation. With real talk and real topics, real people, real problems. Think we need some help to solve them and leave it up to Colin and the Donovan. Right, Cause that's the what, what's that? Uh oh. Let's get ready. And just like a red, white, and blue phoenix rising from the ashes of political bipartisanship, we are back. To Salt of the Streets podcast. And this is Saturday, April 27th, 104 p.m., episode 50 fucking six. Boom. Welcome back, everybody, to the Salt of the Streets podcast, your one and only source for social and political commentary on all the weekly news, pop culture, and sports that you could stand. And it's all built from the ground up for people like you and me, the everyday normal person. So come down and join us as we discuss life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness <clears throat> and continue our endless efforts to bridge the gap between people and information. As always, we are your hosts. I'm Colin. I'm Donovan. And coming up on this week's show, we're diving into the Mueller report finally and all of its implications that have unfolded over the last week. We've got good old rambling Joe Biden Joining the 2020 race, so we're going to touch up on the now 20 candidates in the Democratic race. So they've all been hitting the campaign trail pretty hard, so we've got updates on them. Donovan has a fully loaded sports session today with a lot of serious moves being made for our beloved Seahawks. And of course, time permitting, because that's something that we always need to be worried about, because we could sit here for like five hours and talk if we wanted to. Uh, we're going to maybe get up on some uh, some grab bag topics because it's just been too long since we've been together. So all of that and possibly much, much more coming up on this week's episode of the Salt of the Streets podcast. Salt of the Streets. Roll intro. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it has been too... How was your Easter, dude? We were off last week. Yeah, it was good. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, it was all right. Good times? All right? Yeah. yeah it was, it was nice. an all right good times? <clears throat> it was nice. It was nice and small. Hanging out with mm-hmm. some fam? Mm-hmm. I think you talked... Yeah, you talked about it in your blog post this week. Um, yeah, that was that bit. was the you day before. Correct. Yeah, the day before. Mm. Um, my friend, my best friend, Cody, Cody Bear, um, is getting engaged to a girl named Micah who I've known since I was in the fifth grade. Oh, that's um, funny. Yeah, she used to live just like up the road from me. And then I graduated high school with Cody's brother, Brendan. And I've always been way better friends with Cody than Brendan. And so they got engaged. And so we went and had a party at our friend Isaiah's house. And I those London broils that I make for like draft yep. stuff, I made two. I saw pictures. Made two of those. Looks really um, good. And I had them... I made them on Tuesday, and then we ate them on Saturday. So, so they, they were marinating for like, for like oh money for five like days. Five days, yeah, that's beautiful. They were so fucking bomb, dude. Did you kind of do your standard marinade. Yep, yeah, it was like yeah, some teriyaki so and some fucking soy sauce and like lots of garlic and mm. put some sweet chili paste in there this time. Oh, yeah, good. That was nice really little good. change up. Yeah, that was delicious. <sighs> yeah, man, you killed them, London broils, bro. I love that. That's like one of my favorite things to make. I love just fucking like flipping it, you know, twice a day and just being like, this is going to be so good. Well, and it's easy too because you can slice it up and you can eat. Everybody can just eat it with a fork at that yes. time and you're still enjoying a good high quality steak. Yes. Pretty lean. Not a whole bunch of, not too much fat on those things. Well, that's cool, man. Yeah. What about you? I went down to, so last fr- Friday, Saturday, I don't even, Friday. dude. My days have just meshed all together. Last weekend. <laughs> yeah. Last weekend at some point, my Carolina's mom came into town and she's hanging out in the other room right now. Um, she goes back to the airport tonight. Laura. So we're going from here to airport time after a little uh, family visit, of course. 
And um, little Daxy boy, yeah, little Dax gonna pop by the studio with his his amazing mama. Yeah, and we're gonna visit for a minute, and then we're gonna head to the airports. They are great. But uh, last weekend did that. Went to the yeah. What was last weekend? It was I was last weekend was. Did I go to the casino and get drunk that weekend? I think you did. I think that was the one because yeah. Then I, me and my brother Chad recorded a drunken podcast. Yeah, and then. Uh, yeah, so that was a good time. Went to a concert with my mom up there and her friend. Yeah. And ran into her up there at the casino again last night. Her and her friend <laughs> were doing, doing another concert. I think last week was a Leonard Skinner cover band, and then this one was an ABBA cover band. Really? I did, I did not need to go to the ABBA show. No. I, I didn't need that in my life. No. But, uh, yeah, I took Carolina's mom up there her first time in a casino, and she had a blast. She never been to any casino at all. Mm-mm. No casinos. Is it in New York, like not that far from Atlantic City? Yeah, but you don't go to Atlantic City, bro. Atlantic <laughs> City is disgusting. <laughs> you kidding me? Atlantic City is Trump's version of Vegas. Uh, so imagine Vegas if Trump got involved and how he'd just tear it down <laughs> because he's really not a good businessman. I think that's something that we've all learned <laughs> recently, right? Oh. Uh, but yeah, I mean, he had a casino down there, and it defaulted. Yeah. It's just kind of a generally it's just gross. gross area. Yeah, it's, it's the. I think it used to be kind of cool back in the the old days, but because it's the New Jersey version of it of Las Vegas, it's Jersey, bro. What can you do about it? Yeah, you know, there's only so much you can do for Jersey. Yeah, that's no good. Yeah, you know, Southern Jersey gets pretty nice, but eh, you don't need that in your life. <laughs> but yeah, no, she had a blast. Won a bunch of money. Yeah, took her to the. There's some slot machines up there, some video machines. Some slats. Some slats that uh, there's one of them that's a Casablanca themed. And so I always get up in there, put 10 bucks in, see what happens. And then immediately my money just goes <laughs> gone. But she sat down, put in like 20 bucks. And next thing you know, she's walking out with 35. Mm. And then we take her around. She loses about five more dollars through a bunch of regular things. Then we go to the roulette table. And she proceeds to win more money. She's just banging. Yeah. And so I think by with the amount of money that I lost and she made, I think we basically broke even. Nice. But <laughs> I don't know how I funded the whole trip and then everybody else get keeps their winnings. But I only been it all the, works out. I've only been to the casino a couple of times and I fucking lose every time. I mm-hmm. never, never have walked out with more money than I walked in with. So I just don't. I'll go to the casino and I'll drink. You know, yeah. but I'm not going there to gamble because that's not, it's not going to turn out well for me. No, I'm just too, I'm too frivolous with it. You know, like at that point, I, I like I'm there and I'm like, well, I'm gambling, so I should be taking risks. Right. So I'm like, hit me, fuck it. You know, hit me, baby. And then oh, like, it's gone. Yep. And I'm, well, that was a waste of five bucks. Like, so it's, I don't know. It's just not my deal. So, well, if it makes you feel better, I lost $40 on a blackjack table in about five minutes last night. So <laughs> yeah, here, here. That's roulette exactly. table tr- treated me much better. Yeah. I, I gained back a lot of my money that I lost. That's nice. Yeah. No, but it's always, I always just look at it as like a, I'm going to go pay X amount of money, which is going to include, that's just my budget for fun for the night. And if I lose it all in a half hour, then it's, it's over. And then I'm just drinking. Yeah. But if I don't lose it all, then I just, I have fun and I just stick within my budget and I can consider it paid entertainment. It's the only way I can justify it in my mind. It's the only way to do it. It's just like going and hanging out in Seattle for a day, you know. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm gonna spend a hundred dollars. I'm not exactly sure where it goes, mm-hmm. but I spent a hundred dollars while I was there. It's, it was weird. And in Seattle, a hundred dollars is like a couple cups of coffee it's and maybe nothing. a lunch. Yeah, it's nothing. <laughs> I hate uh, it. A lunch if you order off the the hors d'oeuvres menu, <laughs> maybe. So, uh, um, what do you do? You remember when we went to fucking. P.F. Chang's? Yes. You know? Oh, yeah. P.F. Chang's was, like, pretty good. Yeah, P.F. Chang's is not bad. Yeah. I dig it. Yeah. Some good old-fashioned uh, American Asian cuisine. Yeah. Americanized <laughs> Asian. <laughs> it was pretty good. Mm-hmm. You know? Not like, damn, that was pretty good. Like, it was... Yeah. It was pretty good. You, you know, know? It's like I went to Chili's and I had some, <laughs> yeah, I had some yeah. pretty good, you know. I went to Asian Chili's. <laughs> yeah. That's what it is. It's big, fancy Asian Chili's. Asian Chili's with local beers because they, they're too close to Pike's Place to not. Yeah. Which is good because if you're in the mood for a good quality craft beer. 
like this delicious sun glitter peach IPA from Silver City Brewing. Hashtag give me money. Pilsner. Um, and yeah, you're drinking an illegitly smuggled into this country beer. What? It's Can't a- import it, baby. I don't care. It's good stuff, though. It's a nice light Pilsner that's, beer. That's why it tastes dirty. Yeah. It's because it's illegal. Because it's, it, it's illegit. It's because I'm not supposed to How do you feel about it? that? That, that beer is hot, baby. Yeah. Actually, I, well, I don't think it would be illegal to possess. It would be illegal to import. And since, <laughs> yeah. you know, you since weren't involved in any of that, that's totally fine. That's all right. Besides, we just drank. We're going to drink away all the evidence anyways. I'm not a snitch. I don't know fuck. <laughs> Fucking narc. Okay. So what do you want to uh, talk about first? You want to go into Mueller first? Yeah, I think Mueller, the Mueller report probably precedes most everything okay else how much of the Mueller report did you read i mean pieces okay i, so. I have it up on my thing i'm on page 156 of section two or you know part two of two which is the obstruction part so i told the audience a few weeks ago that we would be like one of the very few agencies that are reporting on actually what the Mueller report says mm-hmm. i will tell you this week i did not read it i will read it I will. But I did not read it this week. Half in personal protest, half out of frustration. Personal protest? Uh, yes. Why personal um, protest? Because I was just unhappy. I was frustrated. I was so, so frustrated. With um, the outcome of the report with, or just no, life with, in general? With the lack of, of – and not that like – I wasn't buying into like the democratic thing of like just fucking wait for the report, you know, Mm -hmm. just wait because I feel like, and I'm sure, right, just for total transparency, I'm sure there was at least one time where I was like, this report's going to get this motherfucker, you know, like we don't know what it has, but it's going to get this motherfucker, you know, but I feel also very confident that as time went on, we very much were on the tilt of like, We'll have to wait, you know, because we don't know. Like, this is what's being reported, but we don't know what's going to be in the report, so we have to wait and see what's up, right? Yep. But there just still was, like, this air of, like, you know, it's going to be wild. Like, just wait until this shit drops. It's going to be fucking it's lit. It's going to be hot. And Another I'm, bombshell. And, you know, and then there's there's this ensuing back and forth that I suppose is natural, you know, between the Republicans and the Democrats where they're just looking for anything. They're just, they're just out there like fucking trout hogs. Just, <laughs> trout hogs. Just <laughs> looking for fucking anything that they can dig up to try and sell, you know? Well, and I it's mean, just fucking, I just was frustrated. Like, well, I'm like this, this. Yeah, this is, it's frustrating because we've spent the last two years watching a good majority of people in Congress stake their entire reputations on the outcome of a report that they have no concept of what's in it. Yeah. And now they've had, you know, some of them have turned around and doubled down on it. Mm -hmm. And instead of, you know, we'll talk more about this when we get to more of the implication side, but, you know, some people are still saying that, okay, so we can't indict him, but let's impeach him. Word. Okay. Well, ball's in your court on that one, man. That's up to you. And I've also heard like, you know, I will just give a little fucking toe dip to Kamala Harris. But when I was listening to her town hall thing today, she said, she's like, even if we don't think that he'll actually get impeached, we should still start it. You know, we should still start the proceedings. It's like, for what fucking purpose? Like you're, <laughs> you're sitting here saying you don't think it will go anywhere. So yeah. for what fucking purpose? Because. For what? Like, for what fucking reason? Because yeah. maybe, because then maybe. They'll turn up something that we can indict him for. You know, maybe we'll be lucky enough that we can we can reach farther in the investigations in the Senate. Because you know? we were not happy have, with the outcome of what we got. And it's it's just frustrating. Like it is. So before we dive too deep into that, yes, because I'm sorry. There's an emotional rabbit hole I'm that just we will so go down. <laughs> Emotionally tied to this. Need another beer. Well, we have we have plenty of those. We got beer chachos, bro. There is some some sun glitter in the in the top right hand corner. There's another delicious uh, IPA in there. That I, I can't remember. I think it's Georgetown Brewing or something like that. Um, I'm pretty sure that like if you can't see this because you're a podcast listener, but you should go over and check out the YouTube video. And shout out by the way to all of our YouTube subscribers. We're up to 27. Good, Got a new one. Ballin and YouTube, thank you to everybody. Even though I will fully admit that I have been slacking. I slowly putting up episodes. I'm in the catch up phase at this point. You were pleasantly surprised when you saw how many I was 
I was highly... Oh, yeah, because that was on the last episode, right? Yeah. Where you looked at it on air, and I was freaking out because I had no idea because, you know, I don't... I care about our following. I want our following, but I care more about the content that we put out and the quality of the content we put out. If the following comes, so be it. Um, I can't even remember the point I was going to make anymore. Shout out to YouTube. So shout out to YouTube. And uh, so Mueller Report. You were trying to point out something. Like, was. I don't know if you guys can see this. Cause oh, yes. I, I'm pretty sure that I keep systematically like pinching that corner that you have to squeeze through <laughs> like a centimeter Just a week. A little more. Because it gets a little harder and harder to get through. <laughs> so I'm going to chalk that one up to like continental drift. You're something. keeping me thin, bro. I you're definitely didn't do anything. <laughs> no, you're good. Uh, so so let's talk Mueller Report. Okay. The Mueller Report in general is broken down into two volumes. Volume 1 and Volume 2. Volume 1 focuses in on the aspect of the you know the general collusion narrative and the russian involvement in the in the election yeah and then whether or not it had any ties with trump campaign officials and so on and so and forth before you continue we talked a little bit about this two weeks ago when uh ag bill barr put out his letter in regard to the report so we talked a little bit about I mean, mm -hmm. most of the shit that came out of this report, we talked about two weeks ago and in the two years preceding this. But, yeah, um, two, yeah of course. But there are, there are like some things that, that came out anyway. that we didn't already know. I just wanted to point that out that we, we gave like a, a brief overview of the brief overview. Yeah. Like two weeks ago. The, the memorandum of findings, maybe we could call it. Um, it's not yeah. Essentially a summary, but anyways. They actually now we should preface this whole thing, but before the Mueller report was released that last Thursday, AG Barr yes did a press conference. Yeah, a short press conference. I think it was like ten fifteen minutes. Uh, yeah, I watched it at work. Which, what did you think about that press conference? First, of all? um, man, I forgot. I should have watched that again because I forgot that that happened. Okay, um, well, it was it was kind of at least from my perspective, it was kind of a much to do about nothing yeah and i remember him talking about the only thing i remember specifically was him talking about like the the unprecedented circumstance that president trump was in you know and he was like like rationalizing almost president trump's behavior that's laid out in the report you know yeah he um, stated that because and one of the reporter tried to call him out on that acting if he was in he was acting in defense of President <clears throat> Trump, but right. you know, and I think AG Barr did a pretty good job by saying that you know I'm only saying that now because in the report it's it talks about his his state of mind and Trump being angry at the whole situation right. and, and and certainly my intent is not to question his intent there. Am I by saying rationalize the president's behavior? My intent is not to use rationalize in a negative way so as to mischaracterize um, Bill Barr's representation because I don't, I don't think that he was outright trying to defend the president any more than is the attorney general's job to do so, right? Yeah. But um, like I said, I do feel like it was in in the vaguest form of of the word. I feel like it was a almost a rationalization of his behavior, you know, that he's yeah. under this type of stress and this is going on. And I do understand that it was laid out in the report because like uh -huh. you said, he, he said that, you know? Yeah. And so it was very unnecessary in my mind. And I, th I think it was, he was kind of doing, trying to do a CYA type of thing, cover his own butt. Um, but, it didn't really do anything. It just stoked the, the media fires of outrage. Well, I think he was probably doing, you know, what the president wants him to do, which is yeah. to go out and, and, so, and hey. take kind of every opportunity to say, like, hey, you know, the report says that the president's good to go. You yeah. Know? And yeah, so we I, could not find evidence enough to. I would not be surprised if some type of document were to be leaked that indicated that the president had indicated that he would like Bill Barr to do a press conference about the report, you know? Especially you know. once you take into account the stuff that we'll talk about in the obstruction section right. of this thing. Right. Not that the president outright said, you yeah. know, I want you to do a press conference, but maybe that he said to somebody, you know, I'd really like if Bill Barr did a press conference to talk about the report. And then that person went and said, hey, Bill Barr, DJ Trump just was like, hey, this would be really cool if you did this. Yeah. So maybe you should do that. <laughs> He's got a long track record of doing stuff like that. Exactly. 
So to kind of sum up, I think the first part, which is the uh, the collusion and the Russian interference. Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, it was pretty blatant that uh, there was no there was no evidence found of any persons, American or otherwise, that were directly involved in the Russian interference effort. Um, you know, it's all stuff that we've heard multiple times from you know all the various hearings and in the intelligence agencies over the last two years. You know, there were the IRA, the Internet Research Agency, which. Ex- essentially is kind of a a cyber warfare branch of the GRU, which is the modern day Russian KGB kind of secret service stuff. Um, They were acting as Guccifer 2.0 leaking doc, hack documents to WikiLeaks and they got put out. I mean, it's, it's all hold on pause. So Guccifer 2.0, because this took me fucking forever to understand. God, I don't like fucking forever to understand. Right. So because I'm sure that, not sure. You guys may or may not have heard that term before, that name, Guccifer 2.0, right? So Guccifer 2.0 is a, like a fake, an alias used by the GRU to leak documents to WikiLeaks, right? So was, he, they were posing as a hacker named Guccifer 2.0. Yes. Forever, I did not fucking understand that. I was like, who, like, what the fuck? Like, I thought, I thought it was a program. Like, oh, I thought yeah. it was some, I thought that was like some type of hacking program that the Russians were using was Guccifer 2.0. Yeah, let me to, see if I can download that. that <laughs> it, that's what I'm saying. It took me forever to understand that that wasn't the case just because of the, like, the internet's a weird Strange. place. Yeah, you know? it is. yeah. So it, it was a weird deal. So I'm, yes, not no, to thank you. But for I just wanted that. everyone to understand because it took me so fucking long to understand. And so. I will apologize right now by saying that if I, because this has been going on for so long, if I do brush over something like that, that, you just have no concept of what we're talking about. Please hit us up and we will explain to you fully what this is. It's a little difficult to kind of sum up even just the Mueller report findings yeah. in the time we have now because it is just, it's been going on for so long and there's so many threads to it. That's essentially kind of why I'm wanting to kind of just push through this this first section because it doesn't, and, there's nothing new there. And so I will either, in that case, right, if there's something that you guys don't understand, mm. um, we can either explain it to you via fucking email or, you know, whatever, or we can also point you to the episodes in which we discuss that if that's what you would prefer. So you don't have to go and look through the whole catalog and do whatever. I'll do it for you and I'll find the episodes. So you can be like, this is the episode when we talked about this and this hacking and this report and this whatever, you know, I'll do that for you if that's what you're interested in. Just let me know. What a guy. So what a guy. So I am. We're here to help bridge the gap between people and information. And if that's the form it takes, that's the form it takes, baby. Yep. On any of these social medias that you can see behind us here. Voila. And if you can't see behind us because you're on our podcast, then we have our personal social medias at Salt of the Street is me on Twitter and Alpaca underscore Donovan. And he is at Big Bird Offy on both of those things. And I'm trying to be much more active on Twitter if you haven't noticed. Yes. I'm getting a couple more followings by playing around and stirring the pot in people's comments. I'm trying to move back to Twitter is what I'm doing because that other shit is so toxic and terrible that I'm trying to just prove Twitter's where it's at. That's where it's weird to think about. Like, like in the vast world of the toxic cesspool that is social media, yeah, Twitter's, Twitter's like, actually still one of the, the best places to hang out. Yeah. And that's the place where the minds actually change, you know. Facebook is nonsense where people are just scream and, and can type however much they yeah, want. Facebook's you know? bad, dude. On Twitter, you got to be careful and kind of edgy and like, yeah. like you know, you gotta cool fit the character words. set. Exactly. And, yeah. yeah. On Facebook, you can just go on for paragraphs at a time. And nope, I don't want any part of that. You know what I'm saying? That is none of it. <sighs> nope. Because at least None when you it. start spewing some bullshit on Twitter, you have to get it done in 280 characters. You got to be quick about it. Yeah. Um. But yeah, back to the that first Sorry section there. No, you're good. Um, nothing new, like I said before. Nothing really new come out. There was there was a pretty blatant finding that Robert Mueller found that Trump and the Trump campaign did essentially commit no wrongdoing in this situation. You know, other than the the few people that we already know, George Papadopoulos. Uh, Paul Manafort. And that is in know, regards this. to, you mean the Trump campaign, uh, just to clarify, mm-hmm. in regards to the Russian hacking, right? There is no evidence to connect 
the Trump campaign with the actual Russian hacking or leaking of documents or anything like that that happened in between Russian hackers and the yep. United States. There's no evidence that there was any collusion, coordination, or anything yep. between it, the, the Trump campaign and those people. Yeah, it, it touches on the the Trump Tower meeting with Don Jr., Veselnitskaya, and the whole group of other people that was, was called into question. What does it say about that? Um, that they're stupid? Yeah, essentially that was... Nothing came out of it. There was nothing there. Um, you know, it's the same stuff we heard. There was wow. opportunities to get, you know, oppo research from these agencies of the Russian government, but it at the end of the day, it never actually happened. Nobody yeah. pulled the trigger on it, and so <clears throat> he's clear. He's free and clear. He's not wrong when he says he's exonerated from the collusion narrative that you know people have been pushing for a long time, especially because, as we've covered before. Collusion is not a legal term. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so it's that's at like, this point that would have been an impeachable offense. Yes. But you know, the other one, the the real dangerous aspect of that, if it was to come into play, would be the conspiracy aspect of it to Da-da-da. conspire with a foreign nation like that. And you just you can't you right now you can't make any ties between the two definitive enough to make a an indictment. Correct. Period. And Do you think? No. Not generally. I try not to. It makes my head hurt these days. <laughs> so, as far as... I'm sorry. We can... Are we finished talking about this first section? Because we can... Pretty much. So, as far there's as... really nothing there. All the meat and potatoes is in the obstruction portion in Volume 2. Right. So, there is still questions that remain about the president's intent. Right. Which is yes. which is what is necessary to establish a case for obstruction of justice as far as legally. Yes. Right. Which is not provided in because there's there's 10 like instances or scenarios or whatever the fuck they're called in the report. Right. Of like really sus behavior by the president. You mm-hmm. know, if you don't know the term sus. I love that because suspect, um, suspectful, like like yeah, suspect, suspicious. You know, suspicious. Um, there you go. So when I first learned the term "sus" from odd, I learned it from odd future, from odd future, right? That's where I heard it from, right? And they used to have a show that's called Loiter Squad that was on Adult Swim, and they used to just have like a, a segment where they just interviewed Taco, right? And they asked him what the word sus meant. And he said, he said, I can't tell you. He said, either you know sus or you don't know sus. You know, like, it's like, that's it. Like, it's sus is sus, you know? Yeah, pause button. Who the fuck's Taco? So, so Taco is, <laughs> is one of the members of Odd Future. He's a DJ now. Oh, okay. like he's like Tyler's DJ. So. Gotcha. Yes. Tyler, the creator. Tyler, the creator. Got it. Yep. Who was also a part of Odd Future. Odd Future. That's right. Yep. Okay, see, I that kind of would you call that an underworld hip hop, underground hip hop scene? Or is it definitely at the time? I mean, it they got huge, you know. I mean, it's they are. My point being is that it's there's not a lot mainstream. going on there. They are definitely not mainstream. Okay. That's for sure. I wouldn't so I call shouldn't them feel bad for not um, knowing all the ins and outs. No, of all no, this stuff. I I wouldn't call them mainstream by any means i wouldn't call them underground because they had a huge following Mm -hmm. but a huge following of incredibly dedicated young fans that would beat the shit out of each other in the crowds because they were fucking going so hard in a mosh pit because they love this rap music so much kind of like an insane clown posse type some situation. weird shit yeah, yeah. there's okay um, strangely loyal fans <laughs> one of those fans like I think it was Tyler threw up on stage on this fucking washcloth and one of these fans came up and fucking ate this, some oh. of this stuff, throw up off of this washcloth. Oh, no. Yeah. That's no. so what I'm saying. Nasty shit. That is, that's Nasty not okay. Shit. I don't care who you are. That's wrong in every level. Uh, so anyways, sus, 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 sus suspicious. suspicious. So there's a word. Yes, so there's 10 scenarios laid out, which, what, 80% of them, if not all of them, have been reported on previously. Yeah. Right? Yeah, most of them. Um, and so it's just, it's just sus shit that the president did, you know, and justifications for them and reasons why they weren't 
enough evidence in itself to be, excuse me, to cause an indictment, right? Mm -hmm. But none of these things, as I said, establish the intent that is necessary to show the obstruction of justice. Because no one can deny that he did a bunch of weird shit. At least ten times. That's what this is. You know, ten times that he did a bunch of weird stuff. Yeah. But he did it, one could argue, he did it in such a way to make sure that no intent was ever there you know like michael cohen when he's testifying is talking about this like double speak that the president does you know of uh, he never says exactly what he wants you to do he just kind of says this would be nice if this happened or says that something is and then you know that you're supposed to do it you know and i'm not trying to argue that that michael cohen's telling the truth but it in that narrative you know yeah um you texted me not her just see oh i did um (laughs) So um, wifey's about to watch. Anyway. No, that's fine. <laughs> um, um, oh, that's funny. Yeah. So there's no like, like I lost my train of thought, but that's. that's I will say that so. in the beginning of this section on obstruction, Robert Mueller and his team do lay out the problematic issue with trying to get an indictment or an actual result i guess or you know a you know a suggestion of what to do next or something like that because of the difficulties that intent you know brings up right because you have to show corrupt intent that you can prove beyond a reasonable doubt in a court of law which yes you obviously cannot do in these situations which we'll kind of talk about here in a minute um and so that's where most of the problem lies is that these things that he did, which we'll go over, um, for one, he he ordered them to do these things. What's up, girlfriend? Oh, my gosh. She brought a pizza. Oh, it's going to be a really good postcast today. <laughs> Love, you are absolutely amazing. You know that? In every way, shape, or form, every day, you do not cease to amaze me. I love you too, sweetheart. Go say hi to your mom. <laughs> All right. Oh, uh, so let's just let's just tackle these kind of one by one ish. I don't. I have more than ten, just because there's a lot of different aspects to each of these individual okay. ones. But so, but it is ten that's laid out in the report, right? Yes. Okay. And then I kind of focused on some of the more problematic ones. No, that's fine. I just wanted to make sure yeah. that I that I didn't say something that was incorrect. That's and so all. there are some of these things. They're kind of broken down to kind of a. a a pre Robert Mueller and a post Mueller team, you know, special counsel being informed type of situation. Okay. And most of the prior things we've known about because it happened through, you know, most of it happened in the public view. We're talking stuff with AG Sessions, the Attorney General Sessions, who is no right. longer the Attorney General, of course. You know, stuff that happened with Michael Flynn and James Comey and, you know, all these things that we've experienced at the time and really what it comes down to is president trump whether maliciously or not did attempt to obstruct justice in some form by having by directing his aides or his advisors or someone in the white house to go do something Mm -hmm. that they did not do at the end of the day which could have constituted a obstruction of justice charge. So one, the, you know, let's, let's go to the James Comey issue. So just kind of a quick refresher. James Comey is the FBI director when president Trump comes into office and they, the investigation into Russian collusion and all this stuff is happening, but not on the, just strictly on the DOJ level. And it's not there. There's no special counsel yet. And you remember the famous meeting and the the Comey notes and the memos that he put out when Correct. Trump had him in the Oval Office, and he kind of said, "Hey, man, you know, is there? I mean, Michael Flynn's a good guy. I mean, you can see your way to letting this go, right?" Right. And a lot of people said, "Nope, that's obstruct. That's obstruction. Boom, boom, boom." I remember this. Unfortunately, that is only obstruction of justice if he was to have actually pulled the trigger on that. And if Comey of, would have done it. Yeah, if he would have ordered Comey to do it and Comey did it, that would have been an obstruction of justice, possibly. Possibly. So, so he didn't pick shitty enough people to be in his cabinet. The only reason Trump is not in serious, serious legal problems right now, 
or even just political problems with impeachment is because the people that he has surrounded himself with over the past two years have systematically ignored orders given to them or subversive messages given to them to go do something that they knew was wrong and illegal, possibly illegal, and would have ended up in an obstruction of justice charge. Because or could have, I should say. It's not it's not totally guaranteed, but um and in this case, you know, telling Comey to essentially hinting at Comey to drop the Michael Flynn case. That is one. Um I mean there's there's so many of because Michael Flynn had met secretly or not secretly, but with the Russian ambassador, Sergei Kislyak. Mm -hmm. And he did not disclose that. He lied to Vice President Pence about the whole thing. And and essentially lied to the FBI FBI about it. And that's why Mike, that's why Michael Flynn is being charged at this time and being investigated and looked at. And so Trump tried to make that not happen. And that did not happen. So all these people, like you were saying, the people in his cabinet, they didn't do those things because they knew better and he did not. Yeah. Right. It's which kind is, of brings which back is, the old Nixon days, you know? It's yeah. Like he would get drunk and say some really screwed up shit and be like, oh, yeah, go fucking fire this guy or something. And they're like, okay, let's give him 24 hours to sleep it off and, and see what happens. And I think that's very interesting because that's something that people have talked about. I mean, since. Since he was running, right, that that he didn't he didn't know enough about the job to even know what his responsibilities were or what yeah. he could and couldn't do. Like he doesn't know? know what's wrong, right? Because he doesn't know the rules behind it, right? So which it's, is, which so is no it's, excuse, mind you, because ignorance to the law is no excuse for breaking the law. But it's good that he had better people. Well, not better, no. but he had at least that quality of people working for him that knew better. You know. I mean, so some could say at some. least. <laughs> some would say that. Some would be like, damn it, they saved his ass. Yeah. Um, the other big portion kind of pre What do you pre-Muller, think? Do you think that that's a positive thing or? That he has those people around him? Mm-hmm. Um, just strictly looking at it objectively, not looking at the personalities in play. I think it's an amazing thing that the office of the, office of the president has some protection from itself. I think that's a good thing for the executive branch as a whole. Yeah. And I'm I'm glad that, you know, through all these things we're going to talk about, that he wasn't allowed to go through with these things. I because think that's it, a da- that would set a dangerous precedent for one. And yeah. I just, you know, save him from himself. You know, he shouldn't be there anyways, but screw it. He's in. Well, and I, I think that it certainly speaks to the value of – having a president who has at least some knowledge of executive power or the constitution maybe or Just general civic anything maybe. you know <laughs> um, i think that that's it speaks to the value of that you know because yeah. it's what did what did nixon do before he was president he was like a senator and shit like that right he was a politician prior to that probably but do you know what he did uh, prior to politics you know, we can find that out here. Because I'd be interested to know, you know, that's whether a, he was. That's like, a Google uh, question, bro. A yeah, Google well, and I, don't, I don't know. You know <laughs> it's it's one of those things. That's the type of thing that maybe I would know, you know. So I'd Let's be interested to know what he did before he was a politician. Um, this thing's been getting worse. And we're back on. Because he's also like anti. He, I mean, he was like anti Semitic and stuff like that, too. So. Um, yeah, he was a senator from California. Yeah. Um, and he was a, a, a state rep from. Or he's a federal represent representative of the California's twelfth district, hmm. which where is that? Uh, oh, that's like the Bay Area. Wow, I would have never imagined that. That's Nancy Pelosi's district. There you go. Good lord, <laughs> who would have thought Richard Nixon's congressional <laughs> district was San Francisco? Well, congressional <laughs> district of California. I'm so I'm so glad we looked that up. Wow. Anyways. Um, so the next big one kind of, it all revolves around Jeff session and his recusal from the unrest, the Russian investigation. Yes. This was a big to do at the time because Trump was very, very unhappy about Jeff sessions recusal because Jeff sessions in his mind, his AG, I think at the time, his mind uh, mindset was very similar to the Obama administration's relationship with their AG and how he should be there to kind of 
help the president and kind of be, you know, in Eric Holder's own words, the wingman of the president. Well, I believe that there are reports of President Trump saying, like, like you're supposed to protect me. You know, like, my yeah. attorney general is supposed to protect me. That's, like, your job. Which is not the case. <laughs> no. Um, it hasn't played out that way over the last many years, but that is technically the way it's supposed to be. And so upon Jeff Sessions' recusal, I think we can all remember Trump being very, very angry about that. Him talking no endless amount of shit on Twitter about it and just blowing up his spot left, right, and the other thing. Because he wanted he wanted Sessions to unrecuse himself. And it, it the particular point that we're going to point to first here is when, you know, after Sessions was asked to unrecuse himself and he said he wasn't going to do it. He said he wasn't going to do it. He said it like three or four times on three or four different occasions. But at one point he had actually called president Trump had called the white house council council, Don McGahn and told him to essentially tell sessions not to talk about, you know, not to talk about anything in Russia other than the fact that he wants him to come out and say that, you know, the president has done nothing wrong here. He's not involved and all this good stuff, but sessions couldn't do that because he was, recused at the time so he's totally hands off he's not involved in this thing one way or the other and trump was very unhappy about that and don mcgahn came back to the president and said you need to stop talking about this investigation first of all you need to back away because this is this is not going to look good having the president impose himself into this investigation that is currently centered around him yeah and they went back and forth multiple times um Let's see, May 17th, 2017, uh, when the acting attorney general, so now this is um, on the Russian investigation, so I think we're talking about Rod Rosenstein here, uh, they informed the special counsel to conduct the investigation into the 20... 2018 or 20... Shit. Yeah, 2018 election and the involvement with the Russians. 2016. 2016. Why did I say 2018? That was midterms. Um, But look into the involvement and the related matters. And once that kind of came out and Trump reacted to that news by he went around and told all of his, you know, a bunch of his advisors at the White House that, you know, this is the end of the presidency and he wants he wants Jeff Sessions at the time to resign Um, Sessions. Sessions at the time submitted his resignation, but if you'll remember, he wasn't, he didn't actually resign until the midterms in 2018. Mm-hmm. So that's something Trump ultimately did not follow through on, held on to his resignation letter and basically was able to dangle it in front of him for the remainder of that year. Um, but he was told that, you know, he wanted Jeff Sessions to resign because he wanted Jeff to come out and say that, you know, like I alluded to earlier, that there's, there's no, there's no there there. This is all just a waste. This is all just bullshit. And, you know, he said that the special counsel, by the time the special counsel was formed here, had massive conflicts of interest. And he wants, he wants the AG or the acting AG at the time to end the Mueller investigation due to their, their conflicts of interest mm-hmm. in Trump's eyes at this point. And he was advised. Um, said that they're, you know, essentially that DOJ has already looked into that and they have come to the conclusion that his concerns are meritless and that there's no excuse to fire the special counsel, break up the special counsel based off of conflict of interest. Yeah. So some people point that as one of the situations where he attempted to obstruct justice by telling his advisors to tell Sessions to get his shit together and, and, essentially fired the special counsel for conflict of interest. Well, either way, that didn't happen. And so there is no obstruction that, you know, that took place. There's not even attempted obstruction. So it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. So but this was, this was a supposed attempt at it, which never actually went through, which is good because nobody would like that to happen because nobody wants the president, even though it's within his legal rights to fire you know, break up the special investigation at any point because the special investigative team works directly underneath the executive branch of the DOJ, which Trump has 
powers over. Yeah. He can do whatever he wants with it. Um, so that, again, never happened. So he gets off scot-free there. Um, so let's t- so let's talk about yeah because none of these things not to oversimplify this uh-huh. but none of these things actually matter no right and because, not only that yeah right <clears throat> we have reported on all of these things Before. most all of them previously yeah right so and I don't know that there's anybody else. There has to be at least one person, right? But I don't know how much of the population felt the same way that I did, which was like, why are we fucking talking about this for an entire week? You know, why? like it is. And we've already talked about all of this shit, you know, and I f- genuinely felt that had had there been even half as many leaks as there were or people would have just fucking waited like they had been told to mm-hmm. this might actually matter people might actually give a shit even if even if the exact same report came out but if no one talked about it people would really fucking care because they would see a whole fucking 10 20 list of things that they're like that's really weird all that shit is really weird that he did all of that stuff and no one knew about it and know anything like that's really weird, you know, but because we've just been sitting here knowing about all of this shit for 10 years, it's just continued to build on like, well, that's just Trump, you know, that's that's just him, right? Because he does all this inappropriate stuff and like it's whatever. So we're left, at least I personally am left with this feeling like. Well, I hated all the people we had in his office, but at least they weren't total shitbags because yeah, right? because they didn't let him do it, you know? I mean, if anything, they look a little better coming out of this on the back end. And that's what I'm saying, like, that they're, like, they're of at least, their morals are not so low that they would not at least involve themselves, yeah. you know, in some type of obstruction of justice. And it's like, like, where are we at? Like, the, the media has now, and I'm willing to fucking bear some form of responsibility because we talked about it right Mm -hmm. but the media has now put us in a position where it just doesn't fucking matter it's like it doesn't the popular term these days is it's all baked into the cake there was all so so and i'm no i'm not taking this i'm not going to wear this right because we were never in a position where we were trying to take down the president right we're talking about what's going on in the media in politics right we are At this stage in the podcast, way more political commentators than journalists or reporters, right? And so... I am definitely not a journalist. Right. So I'm not going to wear, like, the intent, right? But certainly what people call nowadays the fucking liberal media, right, was out to try and take down the president. And so every single time something like this, they would even get a whiff of something. They would report it and, like, this is it. This is it. This is it. Just wait. If this is what we have, just wait till the report, you know? But you, you report the whole report before it even got here like you so it doesn't even matter yeah. like all this stuff that when it happened in, in to richard nixon you know because there's a lot of this stuff that like you said mirrors behavior done by richard nixon mm-hmm. when it would happen to him they were like what the fuck like why are you doing all this stuff that's really weird why are you doing all this shit because no one except for fucking woodward and bernstein or woodward and bernstein were reporting it you know like it's so i'd and I think a lot of that has to do with the times that we're in compared to back then. It's you like know, the twenty four seven news cycle that we have now needs something to feed. It has masses. to have something all the time, you know. And they need a juicy bombshell to always dangle in front of you. It's DJ Khaled, way to go! You played yourself. You know, <laughs> like what the fuck? Like you played yourself because because you were so hyped for two years that now it doesn't matter. That now what should be a fucking you know, at least a, a large bomb, if not a nuclear bomb to the president is like, you know, we all, well, we already know. So already that's is. all right. We already know. Like, like you said, we're thinking positively about the people that we hated in his cabinet up until this point. We're like, well, fucking thank God for Don McGann. You know, thank the Lord for out, Don McGann. He comes like, out looking like a, like a, a patriot in this one. You know, yeah. we love Don McGahn and we hate Rod Rosenstein. Like, how the fuck did that happen? Like, <laughs> you know, you like, what the fuck? You're at a point where, you know, a year ago, not 18 months ago, they loved Rod Rosenstein, the Democratic Party, the liberal media, all these people that everyone fucking hates. You know, they all loved Rod Rosenstein because there was a report that he was willing to invoke whatever amendment to try and impeach the president through the cabinet. You know, they're Mm -hmm. like, God, champion Rod Rosenstein. What a fucking man. That's the guy. That's the guy we need to be behind. And now 
We didn't get the answers we like, and now he's public enemy number one. Now that he's following legal precedent to not indict the president along with the attorney general, fuck Rod Rosenstein, but thank the Lord for Don McGahn. You know? Thank the Lord. Like, really? That's where we're at now, you know? I I think that when you look into how the the major media, we'll just call them, uh, has treated Comey, from before the election and his, you know, his devastating, you know, press conference for the Hillary Clinton campaign. Right. That he was Democratic enemy number one. And hey, now man. he is held up on this pedestal as a now hero. That was awesome. And I don't, I think that speaks volumes about what they do and yeah, and how they do it. I don't like any part of it. And I think that that's, it is, it has to be at least in part due to, like you said, the 24 hour news cycle, you know, where it just, it just takes 24 hours for them to do something else that you were like, well, maybe he's not a total bag of shit after all, you know, maybe, maybe he's got a couple of good things going on, which really is what you should have thought from the beginning, because this one event that you've seen, as we know, does not characterize this person's entire history, no. you know? Because if you look at James Comey's whole fucking history, you're like, yeah, that guy's probably kind of a patriot, you know? He's been fucking being, being a great FBI agent for however long. Maybe he's, you know, kind of a showboat, kind of a whatever, you know, did some irresponsible shit we don't agree with. But overall, you know, and now you've shined this big light on him that made him a huge douche, you know? Yeah. He's, he's out here <laughs> writing books and doing all this stuff. Like, I don't... Yeah. He is the douchiest of the douches. Like, you, there's some people that I feel like, I don't know, you know? Had you... Oh, <laughs> she brought the scotch. I wanted to show Don your bottle of scotch, love, because it's fantastic. That's a fancy looking box. We're going to have to take a pull off this, <laughs> FYI. I figure. Because, I mean, it's scotch. Gracias, mamita. Mother-in-law sitting in the background. She's giving us a big thumbs up. This beer is really good. It's very interesting. It's like, uh, it's the peach one. It's this the sun glitter. Oh, dude, it's, it's dope. It's weird. Super dope, right? It's Look like wrapping paper around the, the Glen Levitt. So this is a Glen Levitt 12. High quality scotch, my friend. Oh, it's 12 years old. It is was barrel aged for oh, 12 years. Jesus Christ. Yeah. I always drop things here. Ooh, we got to get that sound on, on Mike. Ooh. Ooh, sexy. And this is like, what's the difference between like scotch and whiskey or like bourbon or like what? Okay, don't ask me questions you don't want the answer to, first of all. I want to know. <laughs> I don't really. You so don't scotch. know? Okay, okay, okay. I know the major difference between scotch is, oh no, I just want to take a, a sip, love. I don't, I don't want to be, I don't want to go down again, you know what I mean? <laughs> Last time we did this, I was I was hammering out the no, BSB. No, I'm okay. Thank you. Have I drank any liquor on the podcast since the episode? I don't think so. Since uh, uh I think you had BSB when um, Casey and Drew were here. Yeah, that's because right. Because we all sat around and smashed that bottle of BSB. And, like, we did. Before halftime. So. We smash smash that thing. Casey um, and Drew will do that to you. They, <laughs> they will. They will. They're good influences, yeah, man. What can I say? Paul's not so much anymore, but Drew will do that too. Yeah. All right. So let's actually let's fire through the rest of this stuff real quick before we get to the, the implications part, which is hard to do because you want to kind of address every one of these yes. a little bit. So a month later, June. Sorry, 17th, I got upset. I don't. It's okay. No, it, there's plenty to get upset about. It, there really is, and especially after we go through this, I'm going to ask you another question. I think directly relates to this. So June 17th, 2017, Trump called his White House counsel again, Don McGahn, and said that the special counsel, again, had conflicts of interest and he must be removed. McGahn would not carry out that suggestion and ultimately resigned to avoid what he saw as, if he was to carry that order, could be seen as another Friday night massacre, which calls back Saturday to night. The Saturday night massacre. Which calls back to the Nixon God, firing of the special counsel. Oh, what was his name? The special counsel in Kenneth the Watergate. Star? Kenneth Starr? Oh, no. no that's, that was that's Clinton. Clinton. Oh, um, I don't remember off the top of my head. But either way, he did, he you. wanted to avoid the perception of that. So he ultimately didn't do it. June 19th, 2017, Trump met one-on-one with former campaign advisor uh, or campaign manager and general all-around douchey. Um, Corey Lewandowski. Archibald Cox. Archibald Cox. That's what it was. 
um, and directed a message to give to Sessions, calling on Sessions to come out, um, essentially notwithstanding his recusal. Come out of the closet? What? Yeah, I'm come sorry. out of the recusal closet. And say that, the, <laughs> that the investigation was very unfair to the president, and the president has done nothing wrong again, and that he should talk to the... The special counsel and essentially curtail their scope of Ooh, investigation curtail. to solely looking into, you know, future election campaign meddling from Russia and just get away from this whole Trump collusion narrative. This this is his so-called witch hunt that he's always done. Which, as you will remember, was the intent of the Mueller report or the Mueller probe to begin with. Yes. Was to look into Russian collusion or Russian interference in the 2016 election. Yeah, and then they piggybacked on there to make sure that the Trump. They added that it's kind of like their because they ran in. Yeah, they ran into something, you know, and it was some type of fucking meeting or whatever, you know, or something that tipped them mm-hmm. on to to start looking that way, and then they were like, "Well, that's fucking weird." Right, because you had the and Papadopoulos it, and the the Manafort, and they were exactly. all tied to the campaign. So exactly, then it makes sense to look into that. Um, so anyways, he, he approached Corey Lewandowski with that and told Jeff to give him the message or to give Jeff the message. She's and crazy. Lewandowski said that he understood what Trump wanted from Sessions. And so in other words, he wanted to have Sessions say that we need to limit your scope to something that's not going to touch the president. And um, he ultimately, so later on that month or the next month, I think it's July 19th, Lewandowski um was called into the president's office again. Corey Lewandowski. Corey Lewandowski. And he was asked by the president on what the status of that message to Sessions was. And Lewandowski said that he didn't feel comfortable enough um, delivering that message in person. So he uh, essentially asked one another senior White House official, Mike Dearborn, to do it. Dearborn. Um, like and Michigan. he said... And he said he was uncomfortable. Yeah, Dearborn, man. <laughs> that's your spot, isn't it? <laughs> no, that's uh, no. Jordan's dad is oh. from Jordan's dad is from Saginaw. Saginaw. Um, and then his grand, her grandparents live in Free Soil. Free Soil. And, <laughs> yeah, and Free Soil is like two hours from Grand Rapids. You fly into Grand Rapids, you rent a bang bus, and then you drive the two hours. <laughs> I like how then you, put you that. drive two hours to uh, to Free Soil. I know what what is causing my my memory to to start flashing when I read Dearborn. My neighbors are from a tiny, tiny, tiny little small town in Montana called Deer Lodge. So that's probably where my mind is. Deer doing Lodge. So, anyways, this senior White House official, Mike Dearborn, was also uncomfortable with the task that he was given from Lewandowski. Trump makes people uncomfortable slightly, and ultimately, all the time. Ultimately, Jeff Sessions <laughs> never got that message, which again was good because now Jeff Sessions is walking away clean because he never he never once was touched with this stuff. Yeah. Now there it goes on. There's a bunch of accusations where Trump had made efforts to prevent public disclosure of evidence, um, which is in reference to I think all of his tweets and calling out of, you know, sessions and all these different people that aren't quite following, you know, calling out his former White House counsel and just basically anybody that wasn't doing what he said, getting all pissed off about him and and but that ultimately that's all stuff that was taking place in the public square and you can't really take the words from the president in the public square on Twitter and try to apply them to a obstruction charge because you start to possibly get into some really weird murky first amendment rights and stuff like that where he doesn't have the right like free to, speech and, yeah you know you're well, and i almost kind of feel like free speech i don't know i mean i i guess as the president you should be like the epitome of free speech you know but i almost feel like as the president there's some shit that like there's, you, should you should have fit some right. You should have at least one person who has to read shit before you put it out. You know, just for your own for your own safety, for like, your own good, just for your own good. There should be at least one person who reads and is like, maybe you should say this instead. Mm-hmm. You know, let's change a couple of these words to this to maybe make it a little less offensive or a little less controversial. A little yeah. less what the fuck ever. Like, you should have at least one person who does that. Definitely. For the good of America. You know what that's, I'm saying? That's why because they have speechwriters. 
because you should not trust the president to draft their own speeches. Because if and we, if not, they can draft their own speeches, but it needs to go. Th- it needs to go to an editor because to if, make sure it's okay. If we are laughing at you, most certainly the leaders of other countries are seeing what you're saying, and they're like, "You simple fuck! You know, you just you Don't simple, simple fuck! This thing, like, okay? what are you? What are you saying? You know, you're just you're talking shit to your own people. You know, you're just you're making fun of your own country, and we're all fucking laughing at you. It's like, a disgrace. It's so you remember the the Trump Tower meeting, Veselnitskaya, Veselnitskaya, and in good old Don Jr. Man so of Ford. in the summer of this is one of the kind of the points they they point to as probably the most egregious one of the possible you know preventing public disclosure of evidence yeah and and this is do you remember that Trump dictated supposedly through news reports dictated Don Jr.'s speech that he gave his yes. his uh, yes. Yeah, whatever you call that, the uh, press release or whatever. Right. And in all actuality, it turns out that um, Donald Trump told him to delete one line from his speech um, about the Trump Tower meeting uh, with the press. And so he did tell him what to say. I'm just yeah, kidding. Yeah, whoa. <laughs> Which essentially, when you boil it all down, comes to the president is lying to the public. Right? Which... Again, is it feels dirty, but it's not a crime. And especially with President Trump, he lies to us all the time. Yeah. Whether it's through him directly or through his press secretaries of various variety. Um, Sarah Sanders got called out recently, got essentially trapped in a lie and had to kind of give a, a non-apology about it. But it's not illegal to do. So they, he can do that as much as he wants. And that's... So again, no obstruction. Do you know what? Because man, they take all kinds of polls. You know, mm-hmm. approval polls, disapproval polls. Do you think he should be impeached? Do you think he should whatever? Do you know what the most America thing to do would be? Vote. The most America thing to do. I don't know. Would be for all senators and representatives to take two weeks, go back to their districts and their areas, right? Take a vote there of like, do you think that we should impeach him or not? You know what I'm saying? And then for them to take all that information and then vote back in Washington based on how constituents based on their constituents and be like, listen, I got half of my state that thinks this guy needs to go. You know, we got a problem here, you know, so that's what the most because at this point, what the fuck else like, you know, you know, you know, all this partisanship that if you go based on the standard political processes, you know, mm. it's not going to happen. And that's what the apprehension, even from Nancy Pelosi, is to go and to impeach. Right. So you only have not to, you know, step too far ahead, but you only have the, the more radical members of of this Democratic Party, radical, quote unquote, that are talking about impeachment. Mm-hmm. You know, like I said, Kamala Harris, all these fucking people. Oh, yeah. So yeah, well, yeah, we'll get so, into and, that. In a and, minute. and that's and that's because. That's because the regular people who aren't fucking stupid or pandering to someone else are know that if we look at the numbers, it's not going to work out. Yeah. You know? And so I just... Well, this is why you have, as much as I hate to say her name out loud, Hillary Clinton is piping back up again. God damn, I know, right? And, but she is siding with Nancy Pelosi saying that we don't need to worry about impeachment at this point. We we should not be focused on that. Just beat him. That's don't impeach him, just beat him. You know, beat just him. just beat him in the next election. Just beat him. Even if it's a fucking Republican, just and not even from cuz I don't care. Like and that's not me saying that. I mean from a democratic standpoint, even if it's a Republican, just get someone else there. You know, just someone else. At this point, like that's what you should do. Yeah, I don't want to elaborate on that yet. There's, there's a couple more <sighs> little things I want to hit. So I hate it. You're baiting me. I hate for it. For another round in early 2007, in this early summer of 2017, Trump called Sessions one more time at his house and asked him to remove himself from recusal. And Sessions again did not. Yeah. And then by the time we finally roll around, called him at his home. Yeah, I called him at his house. That's us. <laughs> yeah. Uh, December 2017, uh, after Flynn pel- pled guilty in a cooperation agreement, Trump met with uh, Sessions again, suggested that 
he unrecuse himself so that he can start to take a look at uh, the investigation. And by him, essentially, you know, you've heard the term probably a lot lately, investigate the investigators. Yeah. But if he was to start to do that, he would be looked at as a patriotic hero. And that, again, was not enough for Sessions to, to come around to it, which led to, after the midterms, his resignation. And now we have Bill Barr. Um, so in early 2018, the press reported that President Trump had directed Don McGahn to have the special counsel removed back in June 2017, something we already touched on. But this is when the, the news story about this came out. I don't know if you remember that right off the top of your head, but I'm sure we talked about it. Um, and McGahn, McCain, uh, McGahn threatened to resign instead of carrying out the order. Trump yes. reacted to that news by directing his White House officials to have – essentially to try to have Don McGahn come out and state for the record that – you know, establish a, a train of media reports that this is not accurate. Whatever, whatever this news story is that came out about – Trump telling Don McGahn to get rid of the special counsel in 2017. He wanted Don McGahn to come out to the public and and lie and say that that never happened. Mm -hmm. But, of course, that never happened either, which is, again, good for Trump in this case, because that right there is more bad juju. So those are, I'd say, I think the major ones that I have uh, one heard about and read through. And everything else is, is all kind of very similar to this. It's essentially Trump telling somebody to do something or Trump telling somebody to tell someone else to do something that would have possibly landed in obstruction territory, but then nobody ever carried through with it. Yeah. Um, now, the, the major <clears throat> problem with even, you know, because for all these things we've kind of touched on, you know, they would have possibly ended up as an obstruction charge, right? And I keep using that possibly, maybe. And that's because for most obstruction cases, there has to be an underlying crime. And if you cannot prove the underlying crime, it has to be, you know, through the obstruction case, has to be taken to a court of law, and you have to be able to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. And in this case, since there is no underlying crime, first of all, it's very hard to establish that intent, that corrupt intent. And so even if you were able to follow through with these, because he's been so public about his hatred and disdain and anger towards the investigation itself, yeah, you can't really – you can't assume that he's not just doing this stuff because he's pissed off that it's happening altogether. Because from day one, he came out and said, this is a witch hunt. This is a witch hunt. And I hated on him so much for that <laughs> while it was happening. But now looking at this. It's like this, the best thing he could have done. It's probably the best thing he could have done because he has stuck to that from day one. And that has built a public record of him just being very, very upset about this whole thing. And when yeah. he was not found guilty of any form of collusion whatsoever in the first part, it's very hard to try to say that he really actually obstructed anything, first of all. Something I got really pissed off about the fucking PSA guys, because they led their Mueller report thing, saying by there was 10 confirmed cases of obstruction. <laughs> and like, I, I heard that, no. and I was like, that doesn't seem correct, <laughs> based no. off everything else that I have heard for today. Everything that he lays out was <laughs> in a could be seen as an attempt to obstruct justice, if he was guilty. Yeah. But since he's not, all you're doing, you're obstructing an investigation to nowhere or nothing because there's no underlying crime here. So that kind of to wrap it all up, it's very, you know, scratch the surface looking at the thing. But it's at the end of the day, nothing's going to happen. AG Barr has already said that him and Rod Rosenstein has confirmed with, the, you know, consulted and this and the other thing. And they did not find any evidence sufficient to indict and the collusion thing is the collusion thing there's there's nothing there so he's this report combined with ag Barr and w a g rod rosenstein's opinion on it they've come out that there is no indictment necessary 
Right. So now we kind of get into the fallout from this, which is we're talking about impeachment and we're talking about everybody. Yeah, this is where you live. But before we do that, I did want to talk to you about, I said earlier, I had a quick question for you about this whole thing. Yes. It has not been that long since the, it's been a week since the Mueller report's been out. Okay. Is it just me or did this thing kind of essentially play a dead on arrival role? Straight this up. was this was news for about twenty four hours, you know. You so it maybe trailed through three days, but now it's we're not talking about it anymore. Straight up, and that's what I was. <laughs> I have, what you were talking about, right? Earlier. I, I hope I didn't make your point too soon, but um, no, absolutely, I absolutely, I one hundred percent think so. I I wrote the same thing down that I don't. I had had this been had. Let me let me get this together right. Had the media just kind of reminded people like, hey, the Mueller report's still going, you know, just to let you guys know, like, it's still going on, you know, but not like looked for leaks or pursued them or even reported on it, you know, just mm-hmm. taken and just been like, that's, you know, it's fine. We'll wait, you know, we'll wait, we'll, we'll wait because we want, we want it to be like a whole deal, you know, yeah. but they, well, I don't know. They must have. They must have truly thought that there was going to be more that came out in the report, you know? know. But because there, there isn't. You know, they reported everything, and so it doesn't. Like I said, it doesn't matter. Like it's, <laughs> it just, it's barely. So let's. I, I'm going to attempt to blow your mind for a second. So let's go back to the Comey situation, right? And the media's obsession with what was going on with the Comey thing and the Clinton emails and this, that, and the other thing. They focused so much on that that they shot themselves in the leg and Comey felt like this was either his time to grandstand or he felt pressured to do or whatever. Probably cost Hillary Clinton the election. Right. Right. And so now once this thing gets going and the report is the the team's actually on it and like you said they report every day 24 7 about every little leak detail anything they can pry out most of it being a big nothing burger feels like a never end it's like rachel maddow's you know tax return episode on a loop yeah never get anywhere and once we get a bombshell it's not actually a bombshell it's right speculation so if the media was not incessantly reporting on this issue with Trump and focusing on Trump and coming after Trump, he would not have taken the stance. He would not have felt the pressure necessary to come out against that and label it a witch hunt. And if he would have done what kind of everybody suggested and just shut up about the whole thing for two years and just try to work, this would have been a much major bombshell. Yeah. Not that it would have <sighs> changed anything. But he would have, he would look a lot worse. But I think the obstruction side of it, if if events would have played out exactly as they already did, yeah, right, he would have some things that he would have to answer for, and he may be impeached on the obstruction side of it. But I don't think it would go anywhere, right? Because it's still it's hard to prove. But with the me- with the media's massive coverage on this thing, he has built up that defense of I am just super fucking pissed about this whole thing, and it's total bullshit. And so he doesn't have he has more of a defense now, thanks to the media coverage of who which hate him. Yeah, and it's is that just me that that might be looking at that the wrong way? I mean, that's the way I see it. They have built this monster since his campaign began. They've given him untold billions of dollars worth of coverage time yeah. over anyone else. And they've done a, a, a huge disservice to the American people, to their, you know, to their their democratic cohorts who hold them up in such high esteem and who are they they are so high they're proud to, you know, put on high. And they've done this to themselves. And so I think that, and this is not my opinion, right? But this is how people are able to make the argument that Trump is a genius, right? Because, yeah. because had he, had he not said anything, right? Then the media would have way less to report on because every time something came out, he talked about it and that fueled other reports and more shit, right? Oh, yeah. But had he not said anything at all and was just like, whatever, it's, it's whatever. I'll wait. You know, I know I'm innocent, so I'll just wait, you mm-hmm. know, like any other person would have done were they in his place. Any other politician would have been like, that's fine. I'll wait. You know, I'll wait. I know, I know that, that that's nothing. So I'll wait, you know, just wait until the report comes out is what I'll do, you know? Probably wouldn't have talked about it any even a fucking sixth as much 
as Donald Trump did, right? Yeah. But because he did that, whether, you know, whether that's who he is and he's just firing off or in the back of his mind, he's like, I know if I talk about this, the media is going to talk about it and yeah. we're just going to keep it going, you know? And I just, and, I have a hard time giving him that much. And that's what, and I don't, I don't think <laughs> yeah. that's the case, you know? But, that but does that's, give, that's how people yeah. can make that argument. Is that's that, that fucking 5D underwater chess argument. Yep, that is that they're make. like, oh, well, he knows the media and he knows public opinion because he was on TV for so long and he did this and then oh, yeah. business and all this stuff and knows all these people and played the banks and all this shit. He knows and exactly you know? what he's doing, bro. It's this grand scheme. I think that it is and I don't want this to be a cop out answer, you know, but it's almost a horrible, horrible set of just like coincidence, you know, because he's such like a f- an arrogant douchebag. Mm-hmm. He talks about everything all of the time. And because the media fucking hates him so much, they're just refining anything they can. Like I said, just fucking just just truffle hogs. Truffle just hogs. Anything they can. <laughs> anything they can find to try and dig it up, you know? And that's like the media and now both both political parties are the same in that way, right? Yeah. And this is how I'm going to going to jump to my next point is that because there is this report is, as you said, under fucking nothing burger, right? It means nothing. Each side is trying to find any little tiny thing in the report or that that side is reacting to, to make it seem like it's working for them or against the other side. Right. So like NPR is making the president look, is trying to make the president look like he's fucking scared. Right. There, uh, let's, Let's see, they're saying that the Trump administration is attacking the Mueller report while they're relying on its findings, right? But they're not attacking the Mueller report. They're attacking, like, how it came about. They're attacking the the FISA process and the Carter Page thing and all this shit. They're not attacking the report because because that's what's vindicating him, you Mm -hmm. know? Like, that's what's what's making him acceptable is the report itself. So the, the Republican Party is only attacking how it came about because that's all they can attack, right? Yep. But NPR is trying to take that and spin it into another thing that's like, oh, you know, Trump is scared. He's he's fucking scared, you know, but he's not because he's sitting back. He's fucking, you know, as the blood homies would say, he's bicking back being bull. He's he's hanging out. Right. He's dude. Do you know wow. what I'm saying? So, <laughs> so that was oh a my deep God. cut so, reference that I did not get. <laughs> So, <laughs> but I'll roll with it. I'll roll with it. We'll move on. I'll leave that where it is. So, <laughs> so you know what I'm saying? He gets to kick back and just look fine, you know? So he's not going to attack the report. He's like, the report's cool because it makes me look fine, <laughs> but fuck how it got here, right? Fuck the FBI and fuck the FISA process because they're, they brought this on. Even though I look fine, they brought this on, you know? And then the common commentary when I'm listening to them because because of you, I'm trying to be really good about listening to the Commentary Magazine, even though I Dude, fucking I hate it, right? Commentary Magazine podcast. They are, they're making the Dems out to be reaching because the report is lacking, right? So let me f- find my fucking thing here, right? <laughs> they're saying the Democrats want, want to get Trump on anything, right? They want to get him on anything they can, and that's why they're trying to fight over his taxes and then that's also going to lead to regular citizens getting their taxes pulled if i remember you know, that, if yeah. the courts are able to like pull the president's and that's bullshit that was a They're that was gonna, a massive like, reach that is bullshit you yeah, know? it is and i, mean, I but on a on a fundamental level if you were to look at it strictly as the president and a citizen of the united states you could legally set a precedent that Congress could essentially subpoena anyone's yes. tax information. Yes. But I think they are taking it, they're, they're not looking at the full context as no. the, whoever the occupant is in the president of the, of the United States' office, whoever that is, maybe that's something we should look at and have that subjected to, you know, a, a congressional oversight especially, to the IRS. I don't think it's going to trickle like, down to the normal, to the everyday citizenship level. That's es- kind of a little far reaching for me. Especially when there's so much public question and like concern, I almost am willing to say, about the president's taxes, you know, because there's whatever majority of or whatever portion of the Democratic Party and of America mm-hmm. that believe that there's some sus shit 
that he did with his taxes, you know, that maybe because of Michael Cohen or whatever, believe that he fluctuated the value of his assets to benefit him in the public and then oh, also yeah. benefit him on his taxes. And I'm like, you know what I'm saying? And I would trust that his taxes are probably so well taken care of by some of the best tax lawyers and probably on the face of the planet. He probably has no issues, but I think it's the, it's probably the white collar crimes. If I was going to speculate, because I think this is a legitimate path that some people are concerned about. And I think this is, there's a lot of people that, that say part of the reason Trump was so angry and so worried about this, the, the Mueller report is because it could have led to an investigation into his finances. He had even set himself. That if the investigation goes into looking at his finances and the finances of his family, he'd shut it down. He had said that months and months ago. And I think that is a legit, by him putting up that, that red flag to me, I go, okay, maybe that is something he should look into with, there's something pretty sus about that. If you're right. not, if you don't have anything to hide, why would you bring that up? Right. So there, I think it's some legitimacy to that. But again, I, I think it is also very legitimate that nobody's been talking about that kind of until nobody's really moved on that until the Mueller report was getting ready to come out and then did come out. And like, we didn't get what we wanted. So now we're going to go the other, other route. We're going to subpoena his tax returns from the IRS and we're going to go after him ourselves. And for me, I had two points, right? On, on that point, right? I think that. It may be partially correct, but I think Perfect. it. I think it's also a side effect of them truly being convinced that there's gonna there was gonna be more to the Mueller report. You know, I, that's what and I that's what I think credence. is because, like, not not because they're really trying to find anything, but because they're now at a point, either politically or socially, whatever, where they're like, "Fuck!" Like we told everyone there was gonna be some big shit here, and there wasn't, but. They didn't look into his taxes, so let's go after his taxes because Michael Cohen said some shit, and we can look after that, right? But I also think that when you're talking about his tax lawyers, I think it depends on how long he planned to be president, you know? It's true. Because if he had not intended... If he intended, planned on it from the beginning. Right, if he had never intended on being president until maybe like a year before he started running, you know, however mm-hmm. long, then he's just a businessman. He's like, fuck it. I'm going to get away with whatever I can into it because that's what they all do. That's what they're all doing, you know? That's, that's, how, like, that's why he lied about the, the Trump Tower Moscow stuff. Exactly. All that was still going until all of a sudden it was like, oh, shit. We're actually we're gonna win it. We need to we need to stop we right need to pull now. Pull out now, right because now. We're probably already up shit creek, and we exactly. need to stop this. Exactly. <laughs> we didn't. We had a plan B all set up, but the problem is, if plan A works out, plan B can't be set up. We got to backtrack. And because he's already filed bankruptcy and all this shit before, I'm not 100 percent convinced that his taxes would be 100% clean if, yeah. you know what I'm saying, even if, like, if my, what Michael Cohen is talking about is true mm-hmm. and he has tax lawyers, I don't, I don't think that they would be 100% clean. It's, but that's my, and I, I don't know shit about taxes. That's just a, you know, my un, uneducated I mean, opinion, but that's. If I was to put money on it, you know my track record at the casino lately. So, uh, but I'm still putting my money on the fact that there probably wouldn't be something there they can directly, like, actually criminally go no after no i think it would just be be more sus shit it would be something like this but would have more value politically then, yeah. and socially because they won't be able to report on it until the irs puts out puts it out you know yeah. until until the documents are out they can't report on it because if someone leaks some shit from the irs they're going to fucking prison forever right so yeah that's a no no so this stands to potentially hold more weight politically because it can't be reported on and thus watered down by the shitbag media, the bog fucking swamp yeah. media the that cesspool. exists. Yeah. So on both sides, on both sides, on, on both sides, <laughs> on both sides. Yeah. I think that's, I funny. love saying that now yeah. ever since Joe Biden's um, announcement. Ago. <clears throat> so when it comes to, let me ask you, when it comes to the non indictment by the president, Right, mm-hmm. because he's not totally uh, what is it uh, vindicated? Yes, not that, um, but he's not indicted, right? Yeah. Do you think that that's because of because there's a lot of question about you know the the memo that Barr put out in 2018, you know oh, about, about the, like the unitary executive, yeah, and about how hard it is to you know to get a president to indict a president and stuff like that. 
I think so, that's a that is a non argument for me. Right. So that's what I'm asking. You, just, do you yeah. think that it's because of his, you know, like extensive or extreme quote unquote for people who are on the podcast? Do you think it's because of those views that he has, or because the because of the same precedent that's that limited Mueller also limits Attorney General Barr in indicting the president on the evidence that Mueller had? I think my personal opinion on this, and I'm not a lawyer, but from the lawyers that I do listen to, we'll say that, um, when they give their legal opinions, they, there's just not enough evidence, even in the obstruction, to actually form a criminal case. There just there is not, which is why Mueller didn't make an actual – what's the word I'm looking for? Like an he didn't actually give a suggestion on indictment or not. Right. You know, he didn't give an, you know, impeachment is not a criminal process. So he had no right to, to recommend an impeachment. Um, I mean, some people argue that he could, but I think it, that argument is basically invalid because it's whether or not he suggested they do it or not. They could do it at any point that they want. The Congress can impeach the president if they feel they have. The right to do that. I mean, that yeah. is their right to do that. If they think they got it, they can do it. I don't know what – the Mueller has no say in what they can do about that. Right. And I hate that argument. But when you look at – so from a legal perspective, that's that's one way. You know, There's just not enough evidence to indict given – at least in the opinion of the AG and the deputy AG. But on the – Trying to th- what was what was the other aspect of that I was trying to get? I lost it. The impeachment process. President Mueller. Yeah. Oh, come on now. I'm so sorry. It was it was the AG acting as a defense for him. Oh, I can't remember the last point I was gonna make. At least uh, so we'll stick with that. The legal standpoint from everything yeah. I understand about the situation, there's nothing you could do with it in a court of law, anyways. And you know, with the, with the the IRS stuff and going after his finances, which is actually happening right now, they have subpoenaed his taxes, and now they're in a massive legal, legal battle, battle, which will probably go up to the Supreme Court and possibly set an interesting new precedent. Um, depending on what comes out of that, if it gets to that level. But that's, we're not talking, this is after 2020, by the right. time all this gets said and done. So what are you trying to do other than just obstruct right now? You're just trying to make sure nobody can get anything done. And you're trying to make sure there's investigations going on to to stop anything from happening. I think they're just trying to hang on to anything they can't. That's <sighs> what I, yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Um, but I will say this. The Inspector General, Michael Horowitz, yep. is it? Yeah, he is set to drop his report on possible FISA abuse and abuse in the FBI. All that shit within two weeks. I wanted to say, and it is it is forthcoming very soon. And you know, every Republican that wants to talk about it saying that's going to be a bombshell. But given everything in today's media world, I don't think there's – I'm not planning on it being a bombshell. We'll see. Yeah, we'll see. We're going to wait for the report to come out on that one, which is, I think, what most people should do. Um, so other implications, let's talk more about impeachment because there's a lot of talk about impeachment, and it kind of is a perfect segue into the 2020 candidates. Let's do it. So I will say the my – most despised person in the political realm. Um, and I want to call her Focahontas, but I won't. Don't Elizabeth Warren yeah. um, is blatantly calling for his, his impeachment. Yes. While out on the com- campaign trail, along with a bunch of other crazy shit. <coughs> and this week, yeah, this weekend, last week, the Positive America has been sitting down kind of slowly with all of the, the kind of the more mainstream 2020 candidates. They've been doing it for a couple months. They've been doing that. Yeah. And, you know, I, we listened to, do you listen to the Jay Inslee one? Yes. Um, there's, there's been a bunch of them. Um, and we listened to the Kamala Harris and mm-hmm. the lovely Kirsten Gillibrand. Yeah. That came out this week. Um, and kind of all this is 2020 has gained new 
veracity um, because on Thursday, Joe Biden announced his participation in the race for president of 2020. Yeah. Which has now gotten some very interesting Can I ask you something? Yeah. No. So Definitely not. You can't ask me anything on this podcast, bro. So I was watching Saturday Night Live the other day. Um, I'm sorry they, to hear that. D- no, 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 no. Is it is it good? You should watch Saturday Night. Okay. You should. It's really, okay. it's it's really pretty funny. Wifey sitting over like, yeah, yeah, like yeah, yeah. They do. It's on Hulu, um, and they oh, okay. do like, you know, most of the opening skits are political in some type of way, and they're just they're funny. You know, they're I've just seen a fucking lot of the making skits. fun of people. And there's some shit they make their way through the internet. And there's you know? some shit that I see that I'm like, well. That's not true, you know, but you, then you're like, well, it's comedy. So you yeah. just fucking like run with it. But for the most part, like it, it's really pretty funny. I'd, I'd like that shit. Um, so we were watching it and, uh, it was a Joe Biden skit to open up, right? And it's just like about him making people uncomfortable and just like all this stuff. And so, yeah, baby. So I, so I said to Jordan, I said, I, well, the thing I think is interesting about Joe Biden, right? About this whole, uncomfortable touching scenario thing that he's like wrapped up in right mm-hmm. is here let me let me read this just the to american myself. creeper um, rambling joe biden right 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 i stole that so, from robin williams by the way the late and great robin williams i think that it's interesting because when i first started to hear about this for me it reminded me a little bit of kavanaugh right because the women that were coming out saying this about <laughs> joe biden were saying You know, just now that I'm seeing that he's going to, like, run for president and he's going to, like, do this, I felt like I needed to say something. Like, I'm like, you know, it's come to the point that he needs to, you know, people need to know about this. Mm -hmm. And that's what Christine Blasey Ford said about Brett Kavanaugh, you know, is that, well, once I saw that he was, like, going to be a Supreme Court justice, like, well, it's gone too far. You know, he needs to know about this. And so I want to be very clear that my question and my statement is not about... You know, why did you wait so long to say something? Because that's not what I'm asking, right? Mm -hmm. My question is, what is the difference between Joe Biden being vice president or a senator and him being a presidential candidate, right? Because, and not to be crass, but at any time that he was vice president, he was one bullet away from being president. Yeah. Right. One one bullet, one bomb, one whatever away from being president. Right. Yeah. It's the same so, argument people use when talking about Pence these days. And so I'm I that's like what I'm confused about is is what's the difference? Like what's the difference for you, not for you, but for for anybody mm-hmm. between him being the vice president and him being a presidential candidate? Because it's I feel like it's easier to argue he's in a better chance of being president when he's vice president than now that he's running for president, especially in a market saturated with 20 fucking Democratic candidates. 20? You know? So... 20 for 2020. Okay, so I'm going to be really unpolitically correct on this and tell you that... That's not what we're here for. The only reason that this is now a thing is because of the popularity of intersectionality this was not a thing in such veracity i love using that word today while he was vice president it just was not around intersectionality was growing certainly but it didn't really become a mainstream political way of thought until Donald Trump got into office. What does, before you continue, let me ask you what intersectionality means to you, right? Okay. Because I heard Kamala Harris, Kamala Harris address this earlier this week. I know. And she said that. She's wrong Kamala about that. Kamala Harris told me that. Um, <laughs> I bet she did. <laughs> that intersectionality is a buzzword being used by the alt-right. Yes. And really, intersectionality just means that you are a woman And you're black. And so you're at the intersection of two different groups that are discriminated against generally in the United States. Yes. And I did a whole blog post on this a month or so ago. So let me ask you that. Yeah. So intersectionality to me. um, And so, okay. So there's two different ways to look at this. Intersectionality is indeed what you described. It is. It's the crossroads of two different paths of oppression that one person would would find themselves in and thusly find themselves discriminating discriminated against 
multiple times over by how many of these intersecting roads they belong to. Yeah. So, you know, Pete Buttigieg, for an example, is a gay white male, right? So he is a cisgendered man. It's only one thing. Who is gay. And, and who happens to have a buttload of white privilege because you're a white cisgendered male. And so his, his, his white cisgenderedness overrules his gayness. So his, in the, in the eyes of judging people on an intersectional scale. And now that's, this is where the divide comes is from intersectionality. If you want to take a look at that as it is just by statistically what what more factors in somebody's life are they going to have to deal with? Yes. No matter, you know, if you strip away all the narrative behind all of those and look statistically at the facts, they are different than somebody that is not at the crossroads of being a black female. And this is something we've talked about recently when we were talking about Ilhan Omar, right? Because there were numerous politicians, particularly on the Democratic, more progressive wing, <clears throat> that were arguing we needed to listen to the things that she was saying, regardless of them being interpreted widely as anti-Semitic, because definitionally she, anti-Semitic. Because she right, because we did go over that. Um, because she is a black Muslim refugee from Somalia. Yes. Right. Woman. And and that's not to say that those things are not important, right? Because again, we talked about that. Mm-hmm. Is that not to say that they're not important, but that doesn't provide her opinion with any more value or anything like that than it does with ours or less in our opinion because she has and that's not like this intersectionality the thing you're talking about they were talking about on the intercept or not on the intercept on <laughs> that's really funny on the commentary there this week and i thought it was funny they were describing it almost as like a math equation you know it's mm-hmm. almost like in you know people to judge can't win because like you said he's only got one thing Yep. You know, it's it's only one thing, and that's not enough to to go over his other thing. You know, or is that any of his opponents' things? Right. Yeah. Is that there? You know, Kamala Harris is seen as a front runner because she's a woman and she's black and she's Asian and she's the first one to do all of these things. You mm-hmm. know, and it's yes, we are not making that up. That's not a thing that no. we no, like. We did not have make this done. Up. Actually, that's, the person. That made up intersectionality is anything but alt right. By the way, she, um, she's a oh, what was it now? And I don't think I have my old blog notes for that. Um, but the person that created and coined the term intersectionality is about as far to the left as an individual, politically speaking, as you could possibly probably be without being like an anarchist, because anarchists are no neither left or right, but. It was a term coined by the far left, and it has never once touched the alt-right in anything other than hatred and satire. Right. Right. And so by her attributing the the conversations about intersectional politics and it being wrong stemming from the alt-right, first of all, there is some of that coming from the alt-right. That very, very small selection of people that essentially the alt-right, probably neo-Nazis, white supremacists, actual fascists. That's about all the real alt-right is if you were going to categorize them. But what she's talking about is people of, say, like the IDW, who are all coined as alt-right somehow or other when... You look at them, the only person like on the right in the IDW is like Ben Shapiro, probably. Yeah. Everyone else is pretty far to the left. <clears throat> um, but when... I think Jordan Peterson's a little conservative, a little more conservative. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I always kind of forget about that. I mean, socially, he's pretty liberal. Yeah. Um, I saw a really cool cross-reference chart the other day of people on the IDW and what kind of progressive boxes they check well i Most guess of them check all of them off i guess even socially i think more of like um he has pretty traditional views on like marriage and shit like that yeah like ben shapiro does yeah which he does especially nowadays puts you in a more conservative leaning camp you yeah know? because i know i used to think of myself as pretty progressive until 
uh, not even progressive as like like really pretty liberal until you know I'm like well my wife likes to stay home and like take care of our baby and you know and in today's America that's not okay like, yeah people don't like look at you shit, good old you know? fashioned family values yep so keyword being old fashioned family values but yeah but uh, you know, I mean to get back to intersectionality so there is a, kind of like a technical definition um, but once you kind of bring in the the categorization and, you know, we like to talk about it as the oppressing Olympics. You know, I for, kind of forget yeah. who coined that phrase, but, you know, depending on how many intersections you have at whatever point you're at, you know, whoever your makes up your, you know, your little attributes of what makes you, you. If you have more than someone else, that means that you are more important than the other person because you have been oppressed systematically more. Your opinion matters more. Yeah, and so it's almost a perspective problem. By looking at intersectionality as something that's been holding you back, Yeah. what it does is it it takes away the focus on who you are as an individual. It looks at all your immutable characteristics and then puts you in a category thusly where you should be you should be putting somebody in a category, yes, but based off of their merit, what they do, what they say, what they think, not what color their skin is, what their gender orientation is. Who cares if somebody thinks of themselves as a foxkin? I don't care. <laughs> Are you a productive member of society? Mm -hmm. Okay. That's really all I care about. Are you not a net drain on the world? Go to town. I'm good. Um you know, whether you're black or white or any kind of, you know, Asian or any ethnicity whatsoever, that doesn't matter at all. And by focusing so much on intersectionality, especially when it comes to, to social issues and politics, you're removing the one thing that makes people great, and that's their individuality. And that's kind of where, if I was going to look at intersectionality and kind of label it, I know it's kind of a long-winded. No, that was nice. No, 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 no. No, that was nice. I see intersectionality, and I like that. Basically, to sum it all up, it's wrong, and I don't like it. It's wrong. I'm good. Thank you, sir. I thought it was interesting when you were talking about broad spectrum, right? Because when I was listening to, and this will get us even closer to Democratic candidates, right? Yeah. Let's start with Kamala We're inching Harris our way there, baby. Kamala Harris was the one that I listened to last, right? I got three of the five C CNN town halls done. I didn't realize there were five individual ones. I thought they were yeah. all on stage together. So... Yeah, they were had... Jay Inslee had one. Cory Booker had one. Kamala yeah. Harris had... They all well, had so one. this particular one on Tuesday, they did five. Yes. Um, so I got three of those five Damn. Done, right? So the last one I watched was Kamala Harris, right? And one of the things she was talking about, she got asked about reparations. So she's talking about the disparity between races in America. Mm -hmm. And she was talking about, and I remembered The Daily did an episode on this like a couple months ago um, about like Black women are like three times more likely to die in a hospital than white women, like during childbirth. During childbirth, yeah. yeah. And I, and so Jordan was like, that's like, I think that's so interesting, you know, and like, how could that, like, what the, what attributes that, you know? Exactly. And so, <clears throat> so we were, she asked me about it and I said, I, I don't, I don't know, right? I can't answer that question to you. I said, but, but immediately it makes me think of, um, the wage gap. Right. It's, okay. It's, it is. It is portrayed generally as, on the whole, across the board, women make less money than men. Eighty it's broad strokes. Cents, whatever the fuck it is. Right. Yeah. But in reality, there's thirty fucking fifty a million different variables that play into that play into that. Right. It's not yeah. just because men and women. Right. Yeah. There's a, a million different things that play into this that attribute to that. Right. So you can say that. But it's an incredibly overly simplistic explanation of, yeah. of what the real problem is, right? The statistic so, is true, but what makes up that correct. statistic and is so, the important aspect. And so that's so Jordan asked me, she said, she said, I am starting to get concerned sometimes that like, do we just live in an area that we're like just so sheltered from racism, you know, because of where we live, that it's really like this, that we just don't know it, you know, because you can't. Facts are facts. Statistics are statistics. If that's the case, you know, 
that black women are three times more likely statistically to die during childbirth or as a result of childbirth than white women. That's a fact. Those are numbers, right? They are. So you can't deny them, right? And I said, and that's that's the case. That is a fact. So, but I I don't know. And it seems strange to me, right? Because if that's the case, if that's the case, just on the board, no other explanation. It's just because of race. So then you have to attribute it to racism in the medical community, right? Yes. I said systematic racism. I said, and point. there's and there's nothing in medical school that's going to make you a racist, right? I said, so then at that point, you have to consider that as to be reflective more largely of America as a whole. Mm-hmm. You know, that you that there's that many people that are just racist in America to influence to the point that you're three times more likely to die during childbirth, you know, if you're black. Right. Mm-hmm. So then that seems strange to me, you know, that there would be so many racist people in America, but we're so separated just that so we separated. don't know it. And there's so many racist people, but Democrats are the majority in the country. You know what I'm right. saying? I said, in those two things, like, that's when it starts to conflict for me that I don't understand how those two things can be true at the same time. That racism is so prevalent, but some of those people also are Democrats at the same time. That they don't like black people, but they're in favor largely of progressive and more liberal social ideas, you know? And that doesn't make sense. I don't. And I'm not. You know, I'm not saying like that's fucking bullshit because like the numbers are the numbers, but I don't, I don't, it doesn't seem like it can be so simple as that. It's because it's not, you know, it's because it's not because behind every statistic, especially the, the most jarring statistics, there is context. Listen to that rain. Yeah. I'm picking that up my headphones. Really? Welcome to the, the rainy that's North rad. people. It's spring. Um, that's yeah, why our grass is so long. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, it took me two hours to mow my lawn the other day. Is that your first time this year? Yeah, I mowed it once before it started to really rain. Okay. And then it got longer than it was over the winter. So much that my dog was jumping through. My dog <laughs> was jumping through it. And Jordan's grandma comes back in a couple of days from Florida. And I was like, I have to mow the lawn before she comes home. This is disgusting. Yeah. So I went out there. And I had a jungle in your backyard. Emptied the fucking bag probably 30 goddamn times. Yep. Was, oh, my God. It was horrible. Not going to do that again, are you? Oh, dude. I know. The first gr- grass cutting of the year is always the heavy one for me yeah but uh but anyways sorry Sorry. um so to statistically again yes the statistic is not wrong but the context behind that statistic is more important than the statistic itself because the end point is not what matters i mean ultimately it's what matters but the causal relationship with that end point with that statistic is more important because if you can solve the causal problem that is creating that statistic, you eliminate the statistic. Yeah. And so widespread racism, I will tell you right now, is not the problem and not the reason why it's happening. I, you could, I've heard this talked a lot in, from different people, and, and most people look to you know, income, you know, standard social livings and s- social standings of, of what happens in, you know, predominantly black communities. Right. You know, it's just, there's a whole slew of problems around that community that play into that number in most people's opinion. And you can't, by just stopping on that goal and saying, you know, and just preaching to everybody that, you know, a black woman is three to four times more likely to die during childbirth and just full stop that's what it is that's wrong right yeah it is wrong but let's figure out why let's just not stop there and just make a blanket assumption is because everyone's racist right you know especially when you look at the medical field i mean i don't know if our hospitals are a good representation of the hospitals of the nation like in general but it's a pretty mixed bag when it comes to race at our local hospitals yes i mean from all over the world, all different accents, white people, black people, brown people, you know, every every people. Yeah. They're all there. And so you're going to tell me that the medical institution is racist? No. Okay, let's move on. Let's find, let's find out what's really going on here. And maybe we can look at solving some of those problems. Especially when you are a Democrat who focuses on social inequality. That should be your main goal. That shouldn't be your stopping point. You should right. be able... Let's identify that problem. Let's track down why it's that way. 
and fix it. And so I think it's important that we talk about this because Kamala Harris is regarded as like a front runner almost. You know, even though she's not polling in the front, she's regarded as one of the front runners it's because she and is, when you look at the majority of the Democrats, she's winning. Well, she is at. I she mean, is on that. On, on the intersectional numbers, hierarchy, yeah. she cannot not be a front runner, because where would we be? And also because when Jordan and I were watching this, the the Kamala Harris deal, she said to me, Jordan said, um, "I don't, you know, I don't know that much about any of these candidates, but like I like this woman." You know, she was like, I like, like, most of the stuff that she says is, like, pretty all right, you know, and it's, you know, she is very confident in what she says, and she's whatever, and we disagreed on one thing, because I don't remember exactly what she was talking about, Kamala Harris, but she said on a number of things, why well, I think, I think that we should have that discussion, you know, like, I think we should, I think it's we should have out. that, and, and that's what I said, that's what I was talking about when I was watching, I was like, it's like that's some waffling bullshit. Like she's not gonna. And so Jordan said, she said, and I didn't take it as that. I took it as Jordan took it as her being open to something that maybe she isn't open to now. You know, something that she wasn't before. Maybe she's open to it now. And I said, and I would agree with you, right? If you didn't look at all of the candidates on a spectrum and on like a sheet, you know, instead of just her, right? As if you look at just her. Like, I like her too. You know, before she was running for president, we liked her. Like, we didn't love her, but we, we was, didn't. Yeah. You did not like the way that she presented herself, but when you went back and looked at her voting record, you and her were way more closer than, way closer than you thought that you were going to be. Yes. But it was the way that she presented herself Absolutely. that you were not a fan of. But her actual politics Policies. and policy. You guys were world close, you know, not not straight not on, on, but but, yeah, yeah. but you were closer than you thought you would be. And she that's, was the lesser of many evils, right? So I'm not trying to say that we loved Cam Harris because I also did not love her, but yeah. we did not hate her as the, and we don't hate her now, but we didn't dislike her as much as I. I'm not going to speak for you. I didn't dislike <laughs> her then as much as I do now, right? For that reason, I said, and for the reason because she's running on a more progressive policy than she really believes in. I said, and I know yeah. that because two years ago when Bernie was running, she was talking shit. They were all talking shit. All these people were talking shit. But now that that's what's on, that's what they're on, right? I said, and so she's she's saying this. She's saying, I think we should have this discussion so that if she is to get into office, she is not beholden to a policy that she has set up. She can lean back to her more moderate ways that she truly believes is the right way to have the Democratic Party because – Anybody who's there and knows what's up knows that the way for them to win is to be more moderate, right? But the way to win the public right now or the Twitter public, like the social public, the fucking youth, is to be progressive, Mm -hmm. right? So let's run on this progressive nonsense because they love Bernie. Let's do all this shit. And then when when we get into office, we'll lean back. We'll talk to the Democrats. We'll talk to the Republicans. We'll do the stuff we know we need to do to get something done because Mm -hmm. that's what they want to do. You know, so absolutely, I'm, yeah. I mean, that's what so, anybody wants to do, right? That's, so that's what I said yeah. to Jordan. I said, and that's that's what I don't like about her. And so many of these people balling out here, so loud right now. So then that's what I don't like about her. And so many of these people is I don't feel like she's genuine, right? It's not that I feel like she's open to this because maybe she really is, but she does not believe what she's running on mm-hmm. because two years ago. She was talking shit, you know, yeah. and two years in this instance is not enough for me to not call you a flip flopper because that's what you're doing. You're flip flopping. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I wouldn't even put it that way. I mean, I wrote a blog. About if you had this. to put a political word on it, muckraker, all this shit like Ooh. that's, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. that's flip flopper, flip flopper. That's what it is. Like, yeah. that's Yeah. She's I think you hit the nail on the head. She's about one hundred and twelve percent ungenuine about and what I, she's talking about. And that's what I... Yeah. That's what my beef was. You know? I think when I look at Kamala Harris and the platform that she is kind of building for herself, but really she's just stepping on other people's platforms trying to piece Excuse together me. a path to the presidency. Yeah. In my view. Um, I did a blog about this and I think this speaks to what she is struggling with. And I think it's, it's the fact that the Democratic Party in 2019 and I even... Going back to 2018, um, the Democratic Party does not have – they. if you were to poll 
all the leaders of the DNC, whoever they are, say like the top 10 of them, and you ask them to list their top 10 values as a party, they would be completely different all the way around. Yeah. The the Democratic Party has lost all semblance of itself. It has no idea. It is a party in flux right now, which in essence makes it a populist party because whatever makes them popular at the time wins elections. We saw this in tw- in 2018 during the midterms. Whatever the predominantly populist view is at the time from that political side of the spectrum is going to get you into office. This is yeah. how we got an AOC in the office. This is how we got Ilhan Omar in the office. This is this is how we have the presidential candidates with the platforms they have now. It's because I think Kamala is trying to play catch up. Yeah. Cam- Kamala Harris is trying to play catch up to Is that what her name is? Is Kamala? Kamala, yeah. Okay. I keep saying Kamala. I am she too and I'm not at one point it was Kamala. Okay. Well, I'm not trying to be a dick. I really so I got it. Kamala. All right. Kamala. But, you know, she has and she got in trouble with this because she was at a, a rally or a CNN town hall. I think it was on the CNN town hall where she had I think it was one of the joint ones with Bernie and and Bernie was talking about, you know, getting rid of private insurance as part of Medicare for all or yeah, Medicare for all. And she had not disagreed with that and essentially given room in her thing to say that she was on board with that. And, and she corrected that on the record on the PSA interview. Because and she when, does not want that, which is a good sign for me because that's a very, very scary thing to think about is the complete dis- dissolvement of an entire industry in America. And I don't know personally whether to believe her now or then because also when she announced that she was running, she was like, Private health care, who needs it? You know what I'm saying? And then also was on with Bernie and then whatever. But then when she was on the CNN town hall on Tuesday, mm-hmm. she got asked by Don Lemon about, you know, private health insurance. And uh, she claims that in the Bernie thing that she endorsed, it won't be taken away. It just won't be the the main way that it's provided, but supplemental insurance will still be available. Yeah. Like you can still purchase it, you know, it's because she doesn't and, know what the hell she's talking and about. And that's what, you know what I'm saying? And that's, even, she's just trying to play catch up. Yep. And when she got asked about it, right. She was like, well, well, I don't, I don't support that. Well, well which, which, which bill do you mean? Like, what are you, what are you, what are you talking about? You know? And then yeah. John Lemon would be like, Oh, this one this Bernie Sanders one, Medicare for all this one that you're talking about all the time. Yeah. You know, that says this, because this is what it says. That, you know, within four years, private health insurance would essentially not exist. And she's like, no, 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 no. It just won't be, you know, primary. Like, yeah. It'll still be there. But. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I, I hate to say this, but uh, the only reason Kamala Harris is even a quote unquote front runner is because of her intersectional cred. You know, when you look at, at her major faux pas in. California as DA and as the state's attorney general of California. Yeah. She, have you heard anything about her truancy law that she had helped yes. get passed and all yeah. this? Yeah. You know, and it, it was a well-intentioned law, which, you know, at the time is probably a good thing because she attempted to hold parents accountable uh, for their kids being chronic, you know, truant people. You right. Know, missing a hundred days out of a 180 day school year, stuff like that. Um, but through essentially the only, the only fault she had was essentially drafting the legislation or promoting the legislation that had loopholes in it. And there were actually parents going out there and getting arrested in certain right. districts that were not hers, but it was unintended consequences. I think words out of her own mouth from that, but just as a state prosecutor, you know, a district attorney. That is not going to win her a lot of votes when, you know, those type of statistics. If once if she was, say, like the Democratic candidate for 2020, right? How much of that is going to be played on repeat by the opposition party? All the things of her essentially cu- cracking down on small time drug crimes. Oh, and yeah. Like all this for weed and shit. massive yeah. incarcerations. That. 
will just that defaults her out right now. Yeah. Like I said, the only reason she's a front runner is because of her inter- intersectional <clears throat> cred. Well, and I told Jordan, I said, the thing that really gave her no chance at all for me was when she wasn't willing to call out blatant racism when it was presented to her on that interview with the breakfast club you know like when mm-hmm. when they're at when she's asked about the color of her husband's skin and she's yeah. not willing to call out the fact that that's fucking racist it's a fuck you like that's i'm not doing that i'm not playing a game with a politician who's not even who's so whatever it is whatever the quality is that's making her that way but who's so whatever that you're not even going to call out somebody who's racist because you're afraid of the social backlash if you call a black person racist Mm -hmm. you know like but that's what it is is for for him to have asked that for charlemagne the god because (laughs) he's a fucking a moral cornerstone you know political cornerstone of the democratic party charlemagne the god because fucking mayor pete was on there too apparently breakfast club you have to go on there if you want to be a fucking serious democratic candidate so ridiculous the fucking hip-hop show who gives a shit about the fucking breakfast club i know we have more credibility than fucking charlemagne the god politically like i don't that is i'll tell you exactly why they're going on there and that's because it is a large voting block that is not easy for them to get access to yep so they go on there one time say the right things they might get some extra votes yeah so the just the fact that that because you're you're too afraid to tell Charlemagne the God that that question is racist, even though it is like blatantly racist. Like I know, no, I'm not doing that. You know that's no. that's ludicrous. That's so. bad. Luda. Anyway. <laughs> so I got to look up one more thing because I wanted to say she said something along with I know Cory Booker said it. Um, during the Jesse Smollett thing, modern day lynching. Was she one of the people, boop, 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 calling it an attempted modern day lynching? That's Kamala uh, Harris. Her and Cory Booker. Dummy. Yep. Again, jump the gun, lose it, girl. She also, said in, she also said in this town hall um, when she was asked about, like, gun policy and oh uh, dude you know she was talking about she's like i'm gonna give a hundred days to like do this right but the thing that the thing that i thought was interesting was she said i had to tweet about that that uh like armed intruder drills should never happen in america and i like in schools and I grew up doing intruder drills in school, and that doesn't seem ludicrous to me. That seems totally legitimate, that if a crazy person, even unarmed, comes into your school, however, because you don't want to have anybody there for security. You know, you just want teachers and shit. If someone comes into the school and they're being fucking crazy and they're not supposed to be there, but they're not reacting to to faculty that work there, should the students not then know what to do in a scenario like that? Like, what the fuck? I know that seems crazy to me. What, yeah. that, that should never happen in America. That's crazy. But she's talking about, you know, the fact that that would never be a need because we're such a safe place. But that's bullshit. It is bullshit. Because you can't, even if there's no guns here, you can't take crazy people away if Duh. you're going to let them be on the streets. That's bullshit. The problem you're facing here in this this run up to 2020 <laughs> is that these people are going to be saying some some crazy shit that doesn't make sense because that's what gets them a vote. Yeah. They don't they can get away by saying that because if if really pressed on it, she can backtrack and, and not really backtrack, but she can go back to why she would say that. The real problem. But if she cannot c- campaign on that because it's not as it's not going to win her as many votes as it is to say our kids should never have to do another intruder drill ever again. Yeah. But this, and I tweeted about this because this drove me absolutely insane that she can get on there at the the She the People conference and Word. and say that she's going to give Congress a hundred days if she gets in the office to pass sweeping gun legislation, and if they fail to do so, I will do it with the executive power of my pen and just do it all from the executive chair. And I said, okay, great, great, that's a really good idea, Senator Harris. Why don't we just go ahead and forfeit? 
the rest of the little power that Congress yeah. has left to the executive. That's a great well, idea. And I bet you could find no less than five instances where she has talked about the need to limit Trump's power as an executive. You know, I'm sure I'm I feel very confident that that has happened since he has been in office in any number of executive orders that he has signed and been like, I'm doing this now. Oh, yeah. At least once, at least five times, she's been like, this is bullshit. The executive has too much power. You can't just pass an executive order. <laughs> Excuse me, circumvent, you know, Congress and blah, blah, blah. Like, I, I feel very confident that she said that mm-hmm. at least five times. And so, like, what do you, well, what I'll are you doing? Fl- like, I'll call her a flip flopper on that because she just attacked him. And I, I, this might have been on the PSA episode. I don't remember. I've been listening to a lot of her lately. It's the problem. Um, she also said that, you know, when it comes to President Trump, ha- coming in and start locking up all the immigrant kids and not giving protection for DACA recipients and all this stuff, like for, for him to come do that is egregious and it should, it should, that should disqualify him from serving anyways. Yeah. So, okay. Well, pause button because, the the legislation that it's not even real legislation, the executive order signed that created the DACA program and then kept that in place was not legal to begin with. Right. President Obama did not have the power to do that. And all President Trump did was say, well, we need to start adhering to the law. And he put it to Congress to figure their shit out. But they pointed to the wall. Next thing you know, that's just the immigration debate. Right. And it really kind of, I think the pivot point to, to get to the immigration debate we're having now was based off of his decision to not allow DACA to exist anymore and put it to the Congress to figure it Certainly. out. Certainly, Boom. We had the shutdown, all the good stuff that's, it's elapsed since then. Well, I think that's because that's something that he could do himself. You know, like he didn't have to have Congress there to help him with that. And that was something that he ran on, you know? Mm-hmm. And so in lieu of being able to pass any type of legislation, he's like, fuck it then. I'm just gonna, you know, I'm going to do it. And then you guys do it. And yeah. either way, it's I illegal. look good Figure in the end. Yep. Pass, yep. make it legal. Easy. Done. Right. But no, they can't do that. For, you know, a number of reasons. It's not totally, you know, it's not Kamala's fault. It's not the Democratic Party's fault. Yeah. So I want to go back to insurance real quick. Yeah. Um, when she was talking about her plan for insurance and stuff like that, she said, this is a quote, one out of four diabetes patients cannot afford their insulin. And then she started talking about Narcan and how that could cost up to $4,000, right? Mm-hmm. And then she's talking about she's in, in for... Medicare for all, yep. right? And so when she's talking about this, it seems to me that that has more to do with big pharma and the price of prescriptions than it does with insurance, right? Because yeah. especially if you're talking about Medicare, everyone being covered by Medicare, which would be the government insuring you, right? Should we not talking about, should we not be talking about lessening the cost of the drugs as opposed to increasing the coverage because then we would be saving the government money if they cost less money. Right. And, and And this is, this is something I've come, I don't, I want to be clear, right? Because this is something I've come at president Trump for, right? Because he's talked about lowering drug prices and stuff like that. And I've, I've come here on that because I don't think that that should be the priority. Right. And so my point is not to go back on that now, my point is to question what she's saying, her logic in this, that if mm-hmm. you're using these drug prices as logic for your insurance, should we not be targeting drug prices as opposed to trying to insure everybody, which will cost the government more money, mm-hmm. right? Because Medicare for all is going to cost a fuckload of money anyway. Yeah. But should we not be trying to spend as little money as possible that it like is necessary? You know? So maybe we should cut the cost down before we decide so, to buy in? So that's what I'm like, I don't... I don't understand that as a rationalization for for Medicare for all. Mm-hmm. You know, and I these- do not believe that Kamala Harris has got actually any focus on reform of, say, big pharma. Whereas somebody like Kirsten Gillibrand, yeah, who also uh-huh. endorses a Medicare for all, but it, it, you know, she elaborates on it and changes it does talk about reform of big pharma as a whole to play into that as well. But I haven't heard anything from Kamala Harris directly from, you know, talking about that. Yeah. And again, I think that's just because she's lost. She's just, 
she's just trying to spout off all the things that she can do, she could say to stay in the game until, you know, she can ultimately try to win out. Yeah. Did you listen to that one about uh, from Kirsten Gillibrand as well? Um, yes, from Pod Save America. Yeah. Yes, I did. Um, and let's see what I have here for Kirsten. I, I put uh, Kirsten Nielsen, but it's really Kirsten, <laughs> it's really Kirsten Gillibrand. Um, That's like who, <laughs> your thing. I really like her voice. I can't get over it. Um, I can't match her face to her voice. It's weird, right? It's super weird. I had to look it up and watch a video of her because I was like, no way. Yeah. Like that's, but it's true. She sounds like a 20 something. It's really weird. Yeah. Like she's it's 59. It's super 50 weird. Something? Um, yeah. I don't know. How old is, is Kirsten Gillibrand? Man, I just you looked tell it up me. last night. And I totally so, forgot. yeah, she talked about, I want to hear after I go over these things, I want to hear what she said that made you fucking hate her. Right. Well, I've never been in you, love with her for one. Right. But you, you hit yeah. me up the other day and you were She's like, 52 this is two years it. old. There you go. And she has a 10 year old son. She really. Yep. Wow. And she said that on the PSA. I was like, really? Okay. Well, hey, more power to you. Look at you. Yep. So she talked about, she didn't want to do free college, right? Yeah. She wanted to do public service. In exchange for education, which I was like, I fuck with that. Like, like if, yeah. if anything, you know, if that's what you're going to do, like, if you want to provide college to people who want it, then serve in the military and then we'll give you two years of free college. Like, fuck, you know, the GI Bill, all that. We'll just give you two years of free college. You know, don't fuck the hoops, fuck the whatever. Like, this is just what you get because yep. this is what people get. You and know, she extended it out to more than just the military. Yeah, yeah you know, that's, any- that's just these like... Public service. Yes. So you're talking like hospital work, EMS work, firefighter, you know, firefighting, any of that shit. police yep. force, you know, anything that is a public servant, technically. Yep. You should be able to, and it's on a one to two ratio, which she's talking about now. So you serve one year as a public servant, you get two years of college training yeah. for free. If you do two years, you get four years, which I don't know if the math works out, but I like the idea, like the idea. of getting something for something. Right. Right. Um, She said that she would think about Supreme Court expansion, which is not, we've talked about, is not something that I'm in favor of. No, that Um, is something you do not need to touch. And I think that, I mean, that's. She is less, I was surprised. She is, she is more after reform in the Supreme Court on strictly a transparency and accountability level. She doesn't want to add seats. She's very worried about the, the loss of the filibuster. People being wined and dined and stuff like yeah. that is what she was talking about, is them being able to be taken out by by corporations, yeah, the, the justices, interests. yeah, being able to be taken out by lobbyists and things like that. Yeah. And f- I, I, I felt that, but I wasn't in favor of the expansion, you know. No. It's, I feel like anybody that I'm really going to like, gonna be up on is going to be like, we're not doing that. You know, yeah. like I'm, as long as I'm there, we are not doing that. Like Period. We, full stop. Yep. Yeah, we are not expanding the Supreme Court. We are not. I am open to, like she said, talking about trying to make it more honest and transparent. She also said she's not running with any corporate pack and with no yep. lobbyist money, which is something I'm always in favor of. Always, always, always. If that's what you're doing, I'm, I like that. That's a, that's a point for me. You know, if you're not taking any corporate money, lobbyist money, none of that shit. Like that's, I like that. You yep. know? Yep. Um, she was talking about a pathway to citizenship for illegal immigrants, um, asylum seekers. She said that asylum seekers are a humanitarian crisis. And that's what started mm-hmm. to make me think about like, like, where is our responsibility at? You know, yeah. like, where does that begin? You know, because is it our responsibility because you came to America and asked for asylum? Like, even though whatever that circumstance is has nothing to do with us or may have nothing to do with us because I don't know in particular, right, for everybody, obviously. Mm-hmm. But, um, like, where does our responsibility begin with that? You yeah. know, because I, I don't know. I don't – I've always said that – and I've I've told you numerous times, you know, that – I don't believe what Trump said, like America's full, you know, we don't have any more room. Like that's, that's not the case, but I am certainly under the f- whatever I'm on the tilt of like the country is logistically only made for so many people for it to run effectively, you know, yeah. and with the current infrastructure and logistics that are in place. Right. Yeah. And. And America and Americans should be the main focus of that number, 
you know, if, mm-hmm. of the people who live here and benefit from the system and pay into the system, that should be mostly Americans, you know, people who are born here, people who came here, people who are supposed to be here legally, right? And then after that, there's another cap of like refugees that you take in, people immigrating here every year, people doing whatever, like there's another threshold of we as America, because we're so big, so robust, we can accept so many more people a year, Mm -hmm. you know? But America's only made for that many people. You know, when you start to add other people who aren't supposed to come here, people coming here illegally through the cracks, through the whatever, you know, Mm -hmm. that's when you start to throw off that balance of shit not working out the way that it's supposed to be. And I don't, that's, that's just my general idea of it, right? That's, I don't, I can't vouch for what the numbers are, when the tilt is, when the whatever, but that's, I feel confident logically that that is the case. You know, yeah, and I think if you looked at it through the eyes of, say, our social safety net that we have, all yeah. the welfare programs we have, if you had some other system of financial assistance, housing, something in place separately, a completely separate system that what a United States citizen can tap into as a safety net. Mm-hmm. If you had a separate financial aid system that was not directly tied to that in any way. That would be a different conversation. But due to the fact that any immigrant or refugee that comes in making below a certain amount of money and income is is subject to those benefits that we So have. long, and this should be clear, so long as they are legally entered. Yes. Right? And whether or not, you know, because this is <laughs> – it's, it's not to assume that the that system thing. we have in place – can handle that many people because right. it cannot. It can't handle the people we have now. I only want to be clear about that. I'm not yeah. to interrupt you, but I only want to be clear about that because there is a huge like narrative that's pushed through ultra conservative people that are like illegal immigrants are a burden on the system. They're taking the resources. They're, you know, on food stamps, all this shit. You have to have a social security number to, to get government assistance. You have to. You cannot receive government assistance without a social security number, some type of green card, some type of something that proves mm. that you are here Legally. in some type of legal status. Okay. Like you, you, it is impossible to receive government assistance with no, even if, if falsified. Certainly you could have a fake social security number, fake green card, what the fuck ever, but you have to have some form of documentation to receive benefits. You cannot go there with nothing and just be like, yo, I need food stamps. Like mm-hmm. they won't give it does not work that way. Just to to be very, very clear about how that works, right? I it's, think it's very important to to point out. Um because that's uh, that is indeed a way a lot of people look at it. Is you know, these are people that don't have anything when they get here, which is why they're a refugee. Right. And they need they're going to be on some form of assistance because we are a capitalist run society where things cost money right and if you don't have money you need you still need to be able to have a place to live and eat and all this stuff if you want to try to ride out whatever's going on back at home to move out or if you can get here start from scratch and then move up and find that american dream you're going to need some kind of assistance because a fully grown adult showing up is essentially no different than somebody coming directly out of high school, except they're probably more disenfranchised because they don't speak the language probably very well. Right. And that's another struggle they have to deal with. But to to your point, the country is not – we don't have a no vacancy sign up. Right. Because if that was truly the case, we would not be able to handle the current population growth that we have just from the citizens that we already have. Right. And I think it would be insane to think that when you look at our population growth – Compared to how many people come in, like immigrant or come on a refugee status or something to the country, they can't be even close. Right. And to say that that we can't handle that amount, especially because we're taking in we're taking in less refugees now than we did during the Obama administration, yeah. and like there are more immigrants coming to the border now, mm-hmm. but we're still taking in less. Um, Immigrants over, and for a long time in the beginning of the Trump administration, we were taking in less immigrants over the border than we were mm-hmm. in during the Trump administration or the Obama administration. Yeah, and I think that it really just goes all the way back to some serious, deep immigration reform. We need to we need to actually have a robust immigration system that can 
handle volume or can handle a, a trickle. You know, we need to be able to handle the waves when they come, and we need to be able to to possibly staff back if we don't have the need. You got to try or, this, or find you know some some other form of employment for those same people that are doing that job. But when a wave of immigration or you know refugee migration happens, you have to be ready to pull the trigger on that now, right? Because you should be able to open up your arms and we should allow those people to come in. Cause what does that do for America's bottom line other than get more taxpayers, more people, you know, if you're talking about like work visas and stuff like that, you know, you still taxes come out of your income just like everyone else. You know, I don't think it's, it's probably not the same for refugee status and tell you, you know, once you go out and get a job and stuff like that, of course. So like, would you just be doing yourself a disservice by not allowing more people to start paying taxes. So right? that's what uh, Mayor Pete, actually, Pete mm. Buttigieg, said that he's the first Democratic candidate I think I've heard actually use the term comprehensive immigration reform. And he – amazing, right? Delicious. Yes. Um, and so he really said that and then was talking about – and I don't – didn't like totally – buy into this you know but i like was whatever part of his deal was the people who like refugees and and people like that that are here that are working are (laughs) this asshole he he (laughs) said he said if you think about it they're really supporting us and not subsidizing us because they're working here and paying taxes but they're not gonna like collect social security or any of that shit because they're not going to be here for like longer, which uh, when he got to that point, I'm like, fuck you. But, but in the beginning he was talking about like, really it it behooves us because they're here paying taxes. They're doing shit. And then they may not be here forever, you know, and then they, they're going to be here paying tax for 20 years. And then they're may want to go back home, you know, because they've had a good life, but they're like, you know, what was rad. All of my family back in the country that I was from. And now I have money. I'm going to go have a decent life back there because I got money. I got shit. I'm cool. My mm-hmm. kids are happy here because I've been here for long enough. You know, yep. I'm out. I'm you, going back to wherever. You get enough of those people that increases their their local populations back home. Up, They raise them up to a level where everybody's doing much better. Then guess what? No more immigration problems. Yeah. Because people are good where they're at. That's one way to look at it for sure. Um, but that whole... Going all the way to like, well, they're just, they're not going to draw Social Security, so they're just they're paying into it, so they're paying your way. They're you're subsidizing. subsidizing us, yeah, yeah. That's on yeah. the assumption that Social Security is going to be there in twenty years, even for me, Mayor Pete. Yeah, please and thank you, Mayor Pete. So there's Buttigieg. only a, one of the major things that really turns me off about uh, Kristen Gillibrand, other than the fact that I I just feel like she's a wet towel that yes. has nothing new to say, is the fact that she is pretty pretty well on board the Green New Deal, and she is in love with the idea of putting a price on carbon, yeah. which is you start taxing the polluters and that – because she – see the in her words, the way she puts it is that is – it's not a penalty to corporations that – spew out a bunch of pollution, right? This is incentive on the individual level to make better choices. And I go, fuck you, first of all. <laughs> okay? <laughs> that's, that's no difference than saying carbon is now just another new syntax. Because you choose to do something that we don't think you should do, you're going to have to pay extra. Please tell me that that's right. Because I don't think it's right. No. And it drives I, me insane. I told you when we were talking about the Green New Deal, I was very frustrated. They were in the language of the Green New Deal on the Green Party website, right? They're talking about like taxing people for, you know, for gasoline, but then they're going to use part of that tax to subsidize people who can't afford the tax on their gasoline, you know? So I said, so not only, not only. Are you going to charge me money because I want to drive a truck? But you're then going to give part of that money to someone else who wants to drive a truck but doesn't make as much money as I do. 
So go fuck yourself. Like I don't. So that. go fuck yourself. Fuck you if that's what you think you're gonna do with my fucking money. Like yep. yeah, right. Exactly. If you can't afford a gasoline car, then drive a fucking electric car. I know. Like what are you talking about? Because the government's gonna subsidize it for you. Because that's what they said. They're gonna subsidize everything for you. They're gonna make it cheaper. Yep. And if you can't afford it, they're gonna make it even cheaper so you can't afford it. So you can have one. And you're gonna have a job. Did you did you see Alexandria Ocasio's little? video she made about her being in the future I, commuting to work on the bullet train and she talks about this you know underprivileged youth that got put to work because everybody is we're going to have full employment in in America and they're going to get the training they need to do whatever job needs to be done and she's down there you know restoring the bayous down in like Louisiana or something like that. And then next thing you know, she's going to, she's a, a solar panel installer she getting all that kind teacher. of training. And then she wants to be a teacher. And then she wants to be a teacher. But the, the thing is, is while she's down there in the bayou working, she's making the exact same wage as everyone else doing that same job. Everyone is equal. They get the exact wa- same wage. They get the exact same benefits. So there's you remove all meritocracy out of it. And yeah. It's just it's the the socialist paradise. That kind of stuff I get worried about. And when you, when she's talking about signing on to the Green New Deal, it's that kind of you know she she talks like she wants the 100 percent workforce participation. Yeah. And with all the new things that we need to do to make the Green New Deal reality, there's going to be no end of need to workers. Which also scares me because you're going to start sucking work out of the private industry to get people over there. We don't have that high an unemployment rate. It's, right. it's pretty damn low. And I don't think 4% of the population is going to solve all our Green New Deal problems within 10 years. No. Especially given how long it takes the government now to work on a I also, stretch of freeway in Montana. Kamala Harris got asked about the Green New Deal, right? Mm-hmm. And she talked about... Climate change for the whole time, right? Mm -hmm. And I am so fucking sick of Democratic candidates and people in general acting like the Green New Deal only has to deal with climate change. Like, there was so much more in the Green New Deal than just about climate change that if that's the only thing you're going to talk about, then you're not really talking about the Green New Deal. You're talking about a a plan for climate change. That's something I'm in favor of. You're talking about the Green New Deal. That's a whole fucking slew of things that that are kind that are centered loosely around climate change. Centered very like, loosely. But I do not even try and tell me that the Green New Deal is all about climate change. When, like you said, the end, they're listing off 30 different fucking ways that you can be, you know, oppressed or an individual, you know, that all these people are going to be the focus. Yep. I know. Don't. Don't even. Because (laughs) that's not true. That's a lie. Like, that's a lie. But they're not lying because they're just not talking about it. You know, they're just talking about climate change because it's called the Green New Deal. That's right. It's green. It's green, baby. That's the whole idea is that it's green. Fuck you. Because, yeah. yeah, No, that's not cool. I'm really not in favor of the way that they're speaking. Because the Green New Deal at its core is a complete and utter... A shift in our economic system, our social system, the entire, you know, basically every other industry under the sun. Yeah. Everything is a complete and utter reform and change, which is a very, very, very scary thought. Because once you go down that road, you're not coming back. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I will say, I will give her one more thing, actually, Kirsten Gillibrand. And this was... She, and I don't agree with this, mind you, but she actually has somewhat of a plan for the Medicare for All shift. Um, and essentially, she wants to make it, apparently, this is something she ran on back in twenty or 2006 um, for whatever run that she was running in 06. Um, but she essentially make it a, say, like a 5 to 10% buy-in of your of your income. You yeah. forfeit 5% of your income and you get X amount of benefits. Boom. You're on Medicare. You sign in. You opt in. And then that is so popular that it just spreads everywhere. We provide great service. People want to come to us. It's cheaper. We afford. We give them what they need, what they want. There's no discrimination. Boom. You're just in. You buy into it. 5%. It's the number she's rolling with. 5 to 10% of your income. I wonder Which if that would work. I don't dig it. Because it's very similar to the UK model. Yeah. And they have that, you know, their department of, 
national health or whatever it is. I forget what it is, but it's a total shit show. You know, it's worse than Canada's system, for God's sakes. Um, you know, need a life-saving operation? Well, you're going to have to wait. You're, there's a two-year wait for that. Sorry. We'll get you in when we can. Yeah. And we'll call you if there's a cancellation. <laughs> when everybody starts dropping off, you might get in. Let's just hope you can last longer than everyone else. <clears throat> so even though I think that's completely insane and stupid because Medicare for All is a stupid idea, at least she has somewhat of a game plan for it. Yeah. I'll give her that. I will give her that. But to be very perfectly honest, there's only one 2020 candidate that's at this point, and that's Bernie Sanders. <laughs> Bernie Sanders created the platform that they're running on. And, and then they yeah. add their little, you know, right. I'm going to add this. I'm going to add a little something there. But it's his platform. But especially because, like I said earlier, all these, like we've said before, all these people two years ago were talking shit. That's all they were doing yep. in 2016 was t- talking about how he was crazy and he's a socialist and all this stuff. And now they're running on the same platform that he has run on, you know, for like a long time. Yeah. And... It's just, it's not genuine. They just see that this is, that's what won. That's what would have won last time had they not fucked him over, you mm-hmm. know? So they're just running on this. They're just running with this. Yep. And so only time will tell, but uh, there's a lot of these 2020 candidates that are, are not going to go the long run. So one more thing I want to talk about, motherfucking Maya Pete. Um, on his website, <clears throat> he doesn't have, like a policy page, right? Like a Anything. list. And he said it's because, and this is a quote, he doesn't want to bother people with the minutia of policy until they understand what the broad issues are. Are the broad issues not the policy that you should be undergoing? What the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> what if, that doesn't mean anything. I know that doesn't mean anything. That's double speak for I don't even know what. It's double speak. That's like double that's speak. Double speak for I don't even know what, son. Like 1984 what? reference. It's you, bad. I, how you doing with that book, by the way? I'm doing good. I'm like halfway through it, a little over halfway through. It is so fucking it's good. It's great. It's great. Yeah. I I highly recommend the audio version as well. The audio book is fantastically done. Yeah. It's so good. It messes with your mind at so many levels. Especially for people like us that pay attention to what we do. You're going, oh, dude, no, uh, 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 I don't like this. The audio. Oh, the, yeah, the themes Just, of the book. Yeah. I've had a lot of conversations with Jordan. Um, we can move, we'll move over into a little bit of pop culture real yeah. quick. Um, oh, before we do that. Yes. Have you heard anything about China's infrastructure plan, their global infrastructure plans? I, yes. I did hear that they were planning a meeting with like a bunch of people to talk about investing in different areas around the globe. Okay. I just want you to know, I'm very interested in that. Maybe we'll talk about that. We'll be next keeping week. tabs on it. Yeah, because that's it's a very interesting thing to talk about. I think. But anyway, so, pop culture. Yeah, we'll hit a quick pop culture because then we have to go through the draft picks and stuff mm-hmm. like that. So we'll talk about we're going to talk about Game of Thrones next week. There's sure. supposed to be a crazy fucking battle scene this week. So yeah, I think between the first two episodes and this one, I think that's a good spot. It's a good chunk. Yeah. Of of time. I think this was supposed to be like two hours. It's supposed to be longer. Something from, like that. From what I've heard. Oh, this episode is? Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Word. I've heard that this is the longest battle sequence ever recorded in a movie or in television. And it's going to be longer than the fight scene in Helm's Deep in Lord of the Rings 3. Wow. Well, okay. Which that one went on for like 30 minutes. That was a long fucking battle scene. It's Lord of the Rings. The Two Towers is... Helm's Deep. That's Word. Cool. That's Lord of the Rings 2. So just, just checking you on your Tolkien knowledge. That's here, bro. correct. I'm sorry. That <laughs> is correct. Super fanboy over here. Um, and I guess I th- only thought Return of the King because that battle scene went on for so fucking long. That one was But big. the Helm's Deep one also is super long. So yeah, I think that was the majority of the movie almost. A, yeah. yeah. So this one is supposed to be longer than the Helm's Deep battle Damn, scene. Damn. I never thought about that too. That's a long time. Yeah. Hey man, I'm excited though. Yes. So we're gonna talk Game of Thrones next week, baby. So, so, I t- so if you don't want spoilers, make sure you watch the three episodes that are out right now on HBO Now, HBO Go. Do it quick. anywhere. Do it up. You got one week, baby. We're talking about it next week. So we're in 1984. Mm-hmm. Just talking to Jordan. I told her, I'm just keep talking about how fucking amazing this book is written. Right. Yeah. So amazing. And I told her, I said it's so smart for. 
Orwell to have chosen a person as the vehicle for this story, right? Yes. Because he's there to like personally narrate the things that he is beginning to perceive about this world. You know, instead of just talking about this world in general, you have somebody whose understanding of the world he lives in is growing all the time. You know, and I was like, and that's, that's beautiful. Like that in itself is beautiful that, you know, he, in the beginning, he's just kind of like, just like a good German, you know, like, and then yep. he starts to think about what he's doing and a starts to party. Yeah. Member. He starts to think about what he's doing and what his job is and like rewriting history and thinking about the fact that like what I am doing is literally destroying memories, mm-hmm. destroying evidence of the past to give people the ability to rewrite history based on what they want, you know? Yep. And that's like, that's you know what that up, made me think about? Know? That made me think about the Confederate statues debate and issue. Was, yeah. And that spoke to why I don't want them to go away. Like, I want them to be in a museum somewhere. Let's not erase our history. Do you know who Brittany Fetisi is? No. She used to be a, apparently, she used to be a columnist for Playboy. And really? yeah, she used to write some kind of sex column for Playboy, but she has become involved in the IDW circles and she's a very interesting person to follow. She puts out a lot of interesting stuff. She did a thing with uh, Dave Rubin recently and she was on a Ben Shapiro Sunday special. She's got really? some very, in- she, she's a very interesting Twitter follow. I will tell you that. I So I get involved in a lot of her comment strings and she had said something about Posted, tweeted something about a uh, an article about getting rid of George Washington Monument, the George Washington Monument. What? Because George Washington, in the intersectional eyes, is a slave holding. Oh fuck you! You know, you know, he's a one percenter. He's a, he's all the bad things. We need to get rid of him. Yeah, fuck Thomas Jefferson too. Fuck and, you. And the only thing I could tweet back was 1984, because it just reminds me of erasing history because it doesn't conform with the current populist party's view i don't like that like part of history is being able to frame it for the time you know is being able to to frame your understanding for what it was at the time you know for us to be able to look back and be like that was really fucked up that that happened but at the time selling and owning people was totally legitimate you know it was a totally legitimate business and people would live their whole lives fucking ben affleck's ancestors lived their whole lives being happy selling people you know and that was fine at the time and now we can imagine something more horrific and we have entire tasks for task forces of people to take down you know human trafficking because like that's what that is you know so it's that's I don't know. Without the ability to look back in history and understand what that was and how truly horrific it was, why would we have an incentive not to go back there? Right. Just because the party says no? Just because the party chooses to not... uh, That never happened. I don't know what you're talking about. We've never been racist. We've never been slaveholders. And that's... I get that. There's, There's so much in that 1984 that talks about that. It's. I cannot recommend it anymore. They. I think it was. On, it's on the required reading list for high school or something like that. I read it right? in school. Yeah. But, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. But that is especially 2019. You are. There is no kid that is mentally capable at that point of truly understanding the messages no, in that book. No. You just can't. Like I understand. Everyone should read this book. Everyone yeah, should. But absolutely. you need to be able to comprehend what's actually in it and what's going down. What's the lesson being taught? So go out and get that book. It's good. Yeah. No, it's, it's been around for it's a long fantastic. time. It is fantastic. I mean, all those kind of classic books like that are super cheap at any bookstore. Oh, yeah. At Barnes & Noble, they're literally like $5. Yeah. Like you can go and get, I think they're in a section called $5 Classics. Like I, I swear to God, I'm going to read... I'm going to buy Animal Farm and put that in my stack because I remember yeah. I remember actually enjoying Animal Farm um, when I was in school. Like, I really liked that one. So, I'm going to get that and I'm going to put that one in my stack too. I also have The Jungle. The um, Jungle. Yeah, which is by Upton Sinclair. Um, and I have that one in my stack as well. You could buy it right now on Kindle for $2. No Hardcover. Shit. Hardcover for $13.49. You can Kindle it for $2. Yep. 
and it's a really like a really easy read too. It's, oh, it's like really really super easy. quick read. I don't yeah. I really don't have much time to read, and I'm already over halfway through it. Yeah, but it's, I decided Fridays, Friday morning, Sunday morning, I'm gonna read before I go to work, nice. and that has been a good amount of time for me to read and really kind of get shit going before work, huh? Yeah, that's I can't even imagine trying to do that. Yep, nine bucks on Amazon for the paperback. Wow, go out and get it, baby. You'll you'll thank me later. Um, so, one more quick thing. What do you in want? pop culture? What the uh, hell do you want? Fucking Endgame is out. Marvel <laughs> Avengers Endgame. <sighs> Apparently, it's three hours long. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. That's pretty epic. Oh, I'll do it. I'll but do a, it. I don't give a fuck. But apparently you got to go, because Captain Marvel's in this one, you got to go see Captain Marvel first. <laughs> yes. And I haven't seen that, so I got to go see that yeah. before I watch Endgame. Which is good, because that'll give me time for the, the current crowds to kind of die down. I don't like going to them super packed It's going to be busy forever, yeah. Yeah. But I've heard that it's incredible. Mm-hmm. Um, I haven't seen any spoilers or anything like online yet, so that's yeah. nice. I try not to pay attention. I'm pretty good at avoiding those things. Yeah. You know? Um, I just don't know. If I really, really don't want to see a spoiler, I just don't look for it. I make sure to steer clear from it. If there's people that I know that I follow on social media that blast off about stuff like that. That are assholes. I just don't pay attention. I just, boom, gone. Oh, I see this is about Marvel Avengers things. I'm just not going to look at it. Just keep scrolling, baby. You're strong. I am one with the force. Yeah. Do you have anything else that you want to... Oh, um, I got to tell Jordan when we're starting sports. Um, oh yeah, sports almost. Uh, almost, yeah. Because Jordan got me into this show that is called it's called Big Little Lies, right? And it's totally oh, yeah. you've heard of this show before. It's an HBO show, right? Yes, yeah. I've never seen um, it. So it has Reese Witherspoon. Yes, yes, and Nicole Kidman. Yeah, and Shailene Woodley, um, who was in Divergent. Oh yeah, and that the main, girl, the main girl. Yep, oh, yep. Yeah, I like her. Um, and then Alexander Skarsgård. Yeah, he's also in that. No way. Um, he is married to Nicole Kidman. Interesting. Um, and he is an abusive husband. Um, horrible anger issues, and they will like this. Show is it's it's like I so I watch it in the morning before I go to work. Right? Whoa. I'm, like getting, right? I'm telling you, I'm telling you. 1984 so, <laughs> and some hardcore drama first thing in the morning. So it's really intense. Some mornings I have to watch something else. Um, because <laughs> like like Nicole like, Kidman. Why, why don't you just watch an episode of Black Mirror every day um, before work? Like Nicole Kidman and Alexander Skarsgård will like will get into a fight. And then he'll abuse her, and then they'll have like really aggressive sex, and then like he'll go to work, and and it, so like that happens, and I'm just like, what the fuck is going on? You know, like, every time that happens, it's it's a yeah, it's a shocker. So I mean, I guess that's a real deal, though. That's some scary shit. It's crazy. The yeah. show's fantastic. I didn't think I was gonna like it, but it's it's actually really good. So I I can't recommend it anymore. Okay. Um. So so that's it. <laughs> so that's um, it. Yeah, so we can head into sports, sports. Unless you have anything else that you want to do, nah, baby. Um, cool. So but before I you have, get rolling, yes, turn this baby sideways. Yes. So I'm so sorry. I'm starting to learn that you can't talk into it front ways. Yeah. There we go. So I have a couple of news things that we'll hit, and then we will talk about the draft things, and then that's it. We can get the fuck out of here. So um, the Patriots they signed wide receiver Demarius Thomas to a one year deal. I forgot to write down how much it was worth, but probably several million dollars. Um, oh, yeah. Probably like seven or something like that. Uh, the Ravens extended Justin Tucker. Four years were $20 million. Uh, and like 12 guaranteed or something like that. I think it was like a kicker record, but who fucking cares? Um, Kickers, man. Marshawn Lynch is retiring again. Again? Uh, yes. And this time it seems like it's for real, but who fucking knows? But the Raiders drafted... A running back in the first round with oh, one wow. of their first round picks. So, so wow. I would think they wanted um, somebody. Yes. So it's Josh, Josh something. Mm. Josh, I don't know. I don't remember. <laughs> um, and then during the draft, the Cardinals traded. So last year, the Cardinals drafted a quarterback named Josh Rosen with their first round pick. And then 
This year, they drafted another quarterback with their first round pick, their number one overall, Kyler Murray. So they traded mm. Josh Rosen to the Dolphins for something like some picks or some shit like that for like a second, like a second and a third, I think. So we're saying um, not a good long term investment that way. Josh Rosen was asked last year, but he was also surrounded. He was like in the worst situation of any rookie quarterback that came in last oh, yeah. year, but he was also fucking terrible. So, <laughs> so we'll see. Um, and then. Earlier this week, before the draft, in preparation for the draft, the Seahawks traded Frank Clark to the Chiefs for a 2019 first-round pick this year, for a 2020 second-round pick, and then we swapped third-round picks this year. So we had talked about Frank Clark a couple weeks ago, Mm -hmm. right? Because we slapped a franchise tag on Frank Clark, who... Which apparently doesn't mean much. Apparently, right? (laughs) Um, And... He made like right. So last year he made he made like nine hundred thousand dollars, like one million dollars, right? Just a, just a little bit less. So the franchise tag he was going to make just over seventeen, and he said, "Fuck that! I want more dollars. I want a long term contract, with guaranteed money." Right. So he knew he had to know as a player, as an athlete, that we were had to sign Russ, mm-hmm. that we were going to have to pay Russ. So. If you want to stay here, you need to take a franchise tag for a year. Let us figure out Russ, and the next year we'll talk about a contract. We'll figure some shit out, right? Because he's fantastic. I love Frank Clark. I would have loved to have kept him here. But at that point, you know that you can't stay here if you're not going to take a franchise tag. Because you know we have to pay Bobby Wagner. We're going to have to pay Jaron Reed. We have other people who we have to pay to stay here. Sorry, bro. You're not top on the list. And you are not Aaron Donald. You are not worth $20 million every year. It's not, he's amazing. He's incredible, but he's not Aaron Donald. So it's, you know, I don't know. It's a whole deal. He's, but I'm sure that someone would fucking debate me all day about whether or not, you know, he's up there. But so we traded him, right? And then he signed with the Chiefs for like four years. And I don't know. He's making like $20 million a year or something. It's fucking crazy. Um, Jeez. And so then we went into, the draft, right? The draft started on Thursday and we had the 21 pick and we had the 29 pick and then we traded the 21 pick to get like a fucking second and I don't know, some other shit and whatever. And then we finally picked with the 29 pick and we picked a D end out of TCU named LJ Collier, um, who looks f- super fast. I mean, I mean, he's, he's like a raw player. So he needs definitely some coaching, but we have mm-hmm. really good D line coaches here. We have got, do we have good D linemen here who help? We're good. I, I'm excited mm-hmm. about that. Um, TCU. What is that? That is fucking. F- I hate you. I'm sorry. I'm just curious. I'll look it up if you nope, want to. Oh my rolling. god, Texas Christian University. Okay. That's what it is. Um any university in Texas has a football team, I'll tell you yes. that much. <laughs> um and then we got in the second round of safety, Marquise Blair out of Utah. Mm. So that is a Pac twelve guy. He looks really good. Then we got in the last pick in the second round, I believe, DK Metcalf, who is a wide receiver from Ole Miss. Who ran a fucking four three forty? Who was freak, fucking freak at the combine, right? So he essentially the way that like he's he also is pretty raw, but on like a streak, uh, a route straight to the end zone, he'll fucking burn you every time. You know what I'm saying? So I'm excited. Drop that um, bitch in low gear. Yep. So I'm excited to have him there. We got Russ. You know he just got fucking paid, so he's gonna have to be. He's gonna have to throw he's, a he's little bit. Like, perform. yep. So I'm excited for that. And yep. there's some discussion, like right after DK Metcalf got drafted, then somebody, you know, leaked that reported that oh Doug Baldwin, you know, might not be able to play ever again because of these injuries and all the whatever. And I'll I'll believe it when I see it. You know, I don't think yeah. that that's the case, but you know, we'll see what's up. Um, so after that, we got a linebacker out of Utah, Cody Barton. Um, and then we got a wide receiver to West Virginia, Gary Jennings. We got a guard out of Wake Forest, Phil Haynes. And then we got the corner that I was talking about, Uga Chuku. Uga Chuku. Yes, Uga Chuku Amadi out of Oregon. Um, I like that guy a lot. And then we got Ben Burkirvin, who's a linebacker out of Washington. Right? Oh, so nice. That's nice. Local and boy. he fucking, I was reading... His thing, let's see, on our draft page, because I was reading his shit that he like led the entire nation in tackles last year or something like that. Um, 
Yep, he's an outside linebacker. And let's see. He earned first team Associated Press All American and the Pac 12 Defensive Player of the Year award after leading the country with 176 total tackles, ranking third with 94 solos, all, also posting five and a half tackles for loss, two sacks, two interceptions, six pass breakups, three fumble recoveries, and four forced fumbles. Damn. Balling. Yes. So I am super happy to have that guy around. He sounds fucking great. Um, <laughs> I'm sure because he went a little bit later, he just needs a little bit of coaching, you know, a little bit of mix in time. Yeah. That's fantastic. We have great linebackers there that can help teach him. We Ooh. have KG Reister this year. We got Bobby Wagner, we got Shaquem Griffin. That's going to be there. Who you know has another year under his belt is going to look a bit better this year, probably a little bit more. I think we're going to have Michael Kendricks back as long as he doesn't go to jail. We're going to be good, you know, because he got <laughs> fucked for <laughs> because his shit was insider trading. Remember, he didn't beat yeah, anybody up. Yeah. His shit's insider trading, oh. um, which some people hate, but I don't I don't give a fuck. Um, <laughs> You're like, whatever, dude. So, yeah, I don't give it's a shit. white collar crumb. I don't care. Um, we got a running back, Travis Homer out of Miami. We got a D tackle out of Florida State, Demarcus Christmas. <laughs> um, and, <laughs> and then we got a wide receiver out of Hawaii, John Ursua. Um, and so I, I'm happy. I, I like, I like the draft that we had. I was a little concerned in the first round because I really wanted to see us use the 21 pick and trade the 29 because at 21, there was a safety that Green Bay got something savage. This was his last name is Savage, and he looked fucking incredible. And that I wanted him really, really bad, real um, bad. That's fine. He, you know, he he's gone, but that's that's just fine. Um, but let's see, John Ursua. He's five nine, one seventy eight. That's that's a little Doug Baldwin type of guy, is what he is. Yeah. Um, but I like that. So let's see. He had at least one catch in thirty consecutive games dating back to his freshman season. Damn. Dang. That's what's up. Completing his career ranked in the UH top 10 and career receptions 189, which is ninth. Receiving yards 2,662, which is ninth. And receiving touchdowns 24, which is seventh. That's what's up. There you go. I fuck with that. I like that a lot. So so I feel good about our draft. I, I like the way that it went. And as much as I was sad to see Frank Clark go, I'm happy that we saved his $17 million and in cap space that we were going to pay him, you know? And so we had like, I think 19 going into the draft and the website I was looking at, it projected us spending like six on all of our draft picks and all that stuff. So we'd have like 13 to go and pay someone. And there's a couple of good DNs that are still out there on free agency. So if we could get like, fuck, there is this guy named fucking Ziggy Ansa who played for the lions and was a first round pick. And he, Fucked us up every time we played the Lions. And he's a free agent right now because he was hurt last year. So mm. he didn't produce that much. If we could get Ziggy on stuff for a discount for one year and then sign up for more next year, I would be so happy. <laughs> I would be so happy if we could get so Ziggy happy. fucking on stuff for a year, man. Even just for a year. That would be incredible. He would be great to help teach the other people that we got. Rasheem Green last year was a D and then we got last year. Now we have this other one. We got this year, Collier. Awesome. I love it. I love it. If we could get Ziggy on, I would be so happy. All right. So, I'll put a call into Pete. Yes. For like this, obviously. So there's one last thing I forgot to write yeah. down that's really kind of sad. Um, oh, no. But it's it's sports, so we need to cover it. Um, we talked a few weeks ago, I think, about Tyreek Hill. Okay. Right. So Tyreek Hill, there were some allegations that came out because his son, who I believe is three years old, showed up with a broken arm. Yes, right? I remember and this. And everyone in the house was kind of like, I don't, I don't know, you know, what happened. And so his son was put into foster care and they did an investigation. And then there wasn't earlier this week, the DA in Kansas City came out and said, there's not enough evidence for us to prove anybody did anything, but we believe a crime was committed in regards to the injury of this child. And then like two days later, some audio came out where Tyreek Hill was talking about beating his kid and telling his his wife that she needed to be scared and all this shit. So they took the kid again, and now they're filing charges against Tyreek Hill. So Yikes. it is not looking like he will play next year. Um, and he has another previous charge or allegation that I don't... 
I'm going to say allegation because it's if it's just an allegation, I don't want to say charge, but um, at least an allegation for domestic violence before that we covered, I believe, previously. So we'll see. Um, that will hurt the Chiefs, obviously. Yeah. Not having the fastest wide receiver in the NFL is going to hurt any team. Um, so we will see what the deal will be with that. Yeah. Got to do what you got to do, though. Yes. Do it's a piece of trash. It's a piece of trash. <sighs> yeah, which sucks really bad because he's an incredible football player, you know, and it doesn't help at all just with the image of the league and just anything yeah. like that. You know, it's, it's there was also, fuck, man, there was a kid that got taken in the first round who in high school, they, and they played the, played the video on the NFL Network, like on TV during the draft, of a grown, like a huge, enormous man. I don't, I will have to look up his name, right? But they played video of him in high school. His sister and mom got involved physically, like with some other woman, and he separated them. And then when this other woman was on the ground, he beat the shit out of her, like punched her like fucking five or six times, like a D end. Oh, an enormous fucking man. Oh boy. Yeah. Like, really bad i was i was very disgusting i was really kind of shocked um that they showed the video footage um but let's see jeffrey simmons he's a d tackle so he is 301 pounds it does Jeez. not say his weight on here. Um, but yeah, he was, and he was in high school when he did that. And he was to his credit, right? And that's, I mean, as fucked up as that might sound, he was completely honest about everything from the moment it happened. He never lied about it. He was upfront about every team that interviewed him, every school he went to, every everything. He was totally honest about it. So like there is that, you know, that he didn't lie, but that does not by any means mitigate what he did. Um, it's, it's crazy. Yeah. You know. But I couldn't believe they fucking played the video on TV during the draft. That's like, rough, man. Yeah. It seems, yeah, I don't know if I want to even see that type of stuff. Super weird. I hate when I see stuff like that. Yeah. Man. Which, unfortunately, it it's, could be rather prevalent in the NFL. Yes. You know. <clears throat> and that's, you got taken in the first round. Mm-hmm. First round draft pick, you know? And I... You know, I don't know. Is it that's on the team? You know, like obviously the Titans don't give a shit, but like that doesn't look good on the NFL that he's going in the first fucking round. You know, but you know, maybe as messed up as it is to say, but maybe he was young enough that he learned from that, and and you know, we would hope. You know, it it doesn't sound like he did. Did he do prison time or anything? I don't Um, know. I don't know. I didn't look. I didn't look into. But I mean, regardless of that. You know, if he's available to play in the NFL now, that means obviously he's either done kind of some kind of, you know, reparations in some form to be where he's at now, possibly, or he's learned from that and moved on, which, you know, it's that's a tough thing to do. But if he's really not the same person he was in high school and doesn't, you know, doesn't do that type of stuff anymore. Doesn't cross his mind, or you know, maybe he did learn his lesson, and right, the road to redemption has to be made. I would certainly hope so. You know, you what know? I'm saying? <clears throat> I would look. I would like to look at it that way, but I don't know the details. So yeah, who knows? Yeah. So I thought that that was interesting and like a little bit surprising, but um, word. You know, we'll see. We'll see what comes from that. So uh, with that, uh, Jordan's on the way here, and I think we can hit a line and get the fuck out of here. Let's do it. You know, man. Real quick, real quick, before you do that, how are the Mariners doing? I always the Mariners, go to you for Mariners. The Mariners, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. And They're I doing all right? Have, the Mariners are doing still good holding still. Strong? Yep. I have the schedule up right here, so I can tell you. I should have fucking wrote more stuff about them. Yep, they are 18 and 11, um, and they okay. are playing the Rangers right now. They just started... They are in the middle of a four-game series with the Rangers. They got swept by the Padres, hey. um, which that fucking sucked. Yeah. But, um, they swept the Angels the series before that. Oh, they didn't sweep them. They lost the last game. But then okay. three or four against the Angels, which was rad. Yeah, and now, yeah, now they're in the middle of a four-game series with the Rangers. They play again today at six. And they won yesterday Whew. five to four and the day before 14 to two. Beautiful. So I like that shit. They are hitting like fucking crazy in yeah. Seattle. I love that shit. You know what I love? I love the fact that I could be like, hey, Don, how the Mariners doing? And you're like, 
Let me tell you. Yep. Real quick. Yep. I know. I'm trying to be better, like more well rounded. After the boys' room is ready and everything is done, we good to go. Which I am like, I'm on the last section of wall that it's a really fucked up little piece oh, of yeah. wall that. So, but I have all the normal wall done. It's just this tiny little fucked up piece of wall that I have to like. Oh, I really have to kind of like piece it together, like do the bottom and then just kind of be like, okay, I'll put this mm-hmm. here and then this here. And I'll put that there, and it's structurally sound. So there you that's go. Good. <laughs> so it's yeah. So that's how that is going. And um, then after that, it'll be Don's weekly sports podcast. God damn it! <laughs> no, no, they, see, that will that will happen. This I just oh. fucking did. You lose your spot. It fucking you know I deleted it on accident. Oh and no! It's like a whole. I did that to you. You were all ready to go, and I had to ask you about the Mariners. Boom. Oh, we got it. Yep. Oh, you're it. so, it's you're done. So much smarter with that stuff. In the than notes. I am. Okay. I would have broken down and curled up into the fetal position. I've already. done this several times. <laughs> um, so, okay. So, <clears throat> you know, man, there is nothing like the feeling of another man submitting to your will. Now that's power, and in a lot of ways, that's love. <laughs> okay. All bow to Trump. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Hi. It's okay. You're just a tired boy. Yes. You are. You're just a tired boy, that's all. Yeah, you're all right. 